Once Upon a Mermaid Four Mermaid Tales by Demelza Carlton Ocean Secret by Demelza Carlton 1. A screech and a thump were my only whisper of warning. I sighed. Another suicide. I rounded the corner. The humped body of the big buck kangaroo sprawled like a sleeping seal by the side of the road. No other animal has a death wish, quite like a kamikaze kangaroo. The bitumen glittered in my headlights, as if frosted over in preparation for the dawn. The crunch beneath my tires belied the thought of ice. I knew the sound of crushed glass. The tail lights of the tiny Toyota bled their glow onto the gravel beneath. The tree toppled between those two red eyes had folded the roof into a pair of ominous knitted eyebrows. I slowed to a stop in the gravel behind it, hoping my help wouldn't be necessary. I left my headlights on to illuminate the wrecked hatchback. Hello? I called. The answering groan was deep and came from the car. I peered through the back window, but the inflated airbags inside made it hard to see. I approached the driver's door. Are you okay? I asked, knowing the answer already as I surveyed the damage done by both the kangaroo and the tree the driver had blindly swerved into. No, whimpered a female voice. I, I can't get out. Her door had popped partly open, so it wasn't difficult to pull on the handle to widen the gap. The airbag sprouting from her steering wheel pinned her to the seat. Under the weight of the fallen tree, both the roof and the console tightened into a cage around the airbag, making her car a padded cell in which she started to panic. She struggled to twist out of her seat, but she couldn't. I waited a moment before asking, can you undo your seatbelt, or is it stuck? She looked at me in wonder and began fumbling for the seatbelt buckle. I clearly heard the click that released her before her scream shattered the air. When she ran out of breath, she panted for a moment before she spoke. I'm sorry, she said hoarsely. I gritted my teeth into a smile. Nothing to be sorry about. Let's get you out of there. I helped her out of the driver's seat and onto her shaky legs. Only as she straightened beside me did I see the swollen belly that the airbag had hidden. I had barely a second to recognize her pregnancy before another contraction seized her. My arms were strong enough to support her, but her scream was longer this time. I saw the blood and fluid staining the driver's seat, and felt a frisson of fear. No. Can't hesitate. I'll do whatever it takes to save her. I won't lose this patient. When the sound had died away I said quickly, let's get you to my car where you can lie down. I helped her hobble to my car in time for her to topple into the back seat as her next contraction hit. Her scream rang in my ears but I pulled out my phone, ready to ring for help as soon as she was silent. I looked down. No signal. I held her life in my hands and mine alone. No not just hers. Her unborn child too. So be it. I'm sorry, she whimpered, but I think I'm having my baby too. For the first time I smiled properly. Then you're in luck. I'm Belinda, one of Albany Regional Hospital's best midwives, and I'm on my way to work. I guess I'm starting early today, with you as my first patient. What's your name? Miranda Nelson, she groaned over the next contraction. A gout of blood soaked the seat beneath her. I'll buckle you up and then we'd best get going, I said brightly, hoping there were no police up yet to catch me speeding. If I didn't get her to hospital soon, Miranda might bleed to death. Not on my shift she won't. 2. I'm sorry, Miranda sobbed, before another scream sounded her next contraction. No need, I replied cheerfully. I found myself singing under my breath. I lifted my voice a little so she might hear the soothing song too. After all, it can't hurt. She's in enough pain already. 
A wail heralded another contraction, Miranda's panicked panting punctuating the time between. I glanced at my watch. Five minutes. With the contraction so close, the next one should hit just as we get there. I braked carefully as we reached the ambulance entrance, the sound drowned in Miranda's deep groan. I threw myself out of my door and pelted to hers. Emergency. I need a wheelchair. I bellowed as a stricken-looking ward clerk appeared at the door. Yes Belinda, Helen replied smartly, vanishing back inside. She returned in a moment with the small hospital's only wheelchair, angling it perfectly to catch Miranda as I levered her out of the car. Helen pursed her lips at the sight of blood in the back seat of my car, but she said nothing. I passed her my keys as I took hold of the wheelchair. Can you take care of my car, Helen? I asked brightly, already rolling Miranda inside. With the help of a sleepy orderly named Rob, I quickly ensconced Miranda in a birthing suite, her wail rising as another contraction hit her. Where's Jill? I asked Rob before he left the room. In with Mrs. Barker. She went into labor and won't let Jill leave. Jill and the anesthetist are trying to persuade her to have an epidural, but she swears she won't. Two difficult births in one night, Mrs. Barker and now Miranda. This was going to be harder than I'd thought. I sucked in a breath, wondering who else would be able to help me. Where's Dr. Henderson? Rob shrugged. He's not on duty, he's on the afternoon shift. We got a new intern for the morning shift, he's shaking in his office. I swear he goes whiter every time Mrs. Barker bellows. Not like you, everyone knows you're the ice queen. Cool, calm and collected, no matter what. The last thing I needed was a terrified intern for this birth. Alone then. Can you send the anaesthetist to me, after he's done with Mrs. Barker? Miranda Nelson was in a car accident, and it looks like she's gone into premature labor. Miranda let out another hoarse scream. And get someone to call her husband. He's up in Perth this week, I believe. Tell him we'll have her flown up to King Edward Memorial Hospital as soon as we can. Call the flying doctors for transport, too. I looked at Miranda, straining through another contraction. Rob hurried out, leaving us alone. Just you and me, Miranda, I said softly. No, Miranda gasped out. She's coming. She's coming, you are NGH. Not wanting to believe her, I examined her as quickly as I could. She was almost fully dilated. There would be two patients for transport, not one. And it's up to me to make sure they survive. So she is, I replied, keeping my voice calm. It's time to push, Miranda. I hope you have a name picked out. 3. I watched with worried eyes as the paramedic strapped Miranda into a stretcher and loaded her into the small aircraft, followed by her newborn child. Thank you, Miranda said hoarsely, a smile stretching her face as her eyes shimmered with tears. I don't know what would have happened without all your help. My smile was more strained than hers. She didn't know what would have happened, but I did. The child would be in the hospital morgue, and Miranda might have followed soon after. My pleasure. The hospital staff in Perth will take care of you both. Your husband will be there when the plane lands. The Royal Flying Doctor Service plane's doors slammed shut, and the pilot crunched across the gravel on his way to the cockpit. I heard a shout from across the field. Wait! The emergency gate ground open, motor whirring and metal grating on metal. Both the pilot and I turned to see a lanky man running through the grinding gate and across the gravel beside the tarmac. His long strides cleared the distance faster than I could have. He waved a paper file that looked like medical records. The man was breathless when he reached us, but he still managed to make his words intelligible. The patient's file has to go with her on the plane. He held out the white cardboard folder with a rainbow of numbered stickers up the side. The pilot took the folder with a nod and climbed into the plane. 
I backed away to a safe distance and the breathless man did the same. Glad I got here in time, he gasped. He was almost doubled over, his hands near his knees, as he tried to catch his breath. He appeared to be speaking to the gravel beneath his large feet. I looked around, but I saw no one else within earshot, so the man must have been speaking to me. What did you do to make the hospital staff send you racing out here with medical records? Did you steal one of the doctor's parking spots? I asked, hoping to head off any further conversation. Privately, I thought it more likely that he was a member of the cleaning staff that I hadn't met yet, who'd been sent here by the cowering intern, too shaken to venture out of his office to drive. Instead of being offended, the man laughed. He stood up, and I realized for the first time that the length of his limbs matched his height, he was taller than me. I may be the most junior doctor at the hospital, but I still get my own parking spot. I'm Aidan Lannan, the intern. I wrote up the patient's notes so slowly that I didn't realize she'd left without them, so it was my responsibility to take them to the airport. So this is the new intern, and he's not the useless quivering wreck Rob said he was. He's a man who takes his responsibilities seriously, and doesn't send a flunky to make up for his mistakes. I found I almost liked him. Begrudgingly I began, I'm Belinda, but that's as far as I got. I know who you are. You're the midwife who saved that woman's life and her baby. If it weren't for you they both would have died. His eyes shone with something like admiration. I sighed. I'm the student midwife, who happened to drive past where she'd crashed her car into a kangaroo and took her to hospital with me at the start of my shift. When she went into premature labor, she became my patient, as Jill, the qualified midwife, was dealing with a difficult delivery for a woman who refused anesthesia. I told Jill I'd let her know if I ran into trouble but it wasn't necessary, and her patient needed her more. I hit the gate release and we waited for it to clank open before trudging from the restricted airside gravel to the bitumen between the hire cars and the staff car park. Together, we stood and watched the tiny plane taxi down the runway. It took off, shrinking into the sky until it rose above the cloud ceiling and out of sight. Silently, I wished the woman luck, hoping that her daughter would survive long enough to leave hospital and go home with her mother. My hopes for happiness flew with her. Happiness I will never know. My daughter no longer lives. I sagged, suddenly realizing how exhausted I was. Yet the intern turned to me, his eyes full of unmistakable awe. If that was your first solo delivery, you're in the wrong profession. You should have studied medicine instead of nursing. I couldn't have done it. I was too tired to explain to him that Miranda's child was by no means the first baby I'd delivered, nor the most difficult. Instead, I looked for my car in the parking lot. How did you get here? Aidan persisted. I wondered the same thing as the only car I could see was not mine. In the ambulance with my patient, I replied slowly. The ambulance had left without me. I hoped that didn't mean there would be another emergency waiting at the hospital. If and when I managed to make my way back there. It would be a long walk, more than three hours. There wasn't a taxi in sight, and my bag, my phone and my wallet were back in my locker at the hospital. I heaved a deep sigh and summoned the strength to start the long journey back. Aidan pressed a button on his key. The lone car in the parking lot flashed its orange lights. Let me give you a lift back to the hospital. I considered refusing. I also considered how tired I was. By the time I reached the hospital on foot, my shift would be well and truly over and the sun would have set. I hadn't brought a torch and there weren't any streetlights for most of the way. It'd be pitch dark and I'd be a good target for the Nanup Tiger, if it existed. Okay. I tried to keep my face expressionless. It wasn't difficult, as even the effort of forming any expression was exhausting. Aidan drove a Mini, a very small car that appeared incongruous to his size. He opened the passenger door and started pitching things from the passenger seat into the back, 
before he gestured for me to sit down. He seemed really nervous, apologizing for the mess in his vehicle. I sat in the passenger seat, carefully placing my feet between a pair of very large sneakers and some muddy gumboots. Noticing something uncomfortable beneath me, I reached for it and pulled out a stethoscope, the head of the chess piece decorated with a sticker of a three-lobed leaf. In three strides he rounded the front of his car and folded himself into the space between the driver's seat and the steering wheel. He reminded me of an octopus squeezing itself into a small rock crevice, only more angular and awkward. When he'd managed to wedge himself inside, I held up the stethoscope, lifting my eyebrows too. Oh hell sorry. That's my lucky stethoscope. Dad gave it to me before I left Ireland, and I forgot to take it off before I left the hospital. He took it from me and stuffed it into the glove box. He said little and I said less for the start of the drive until we were forced to stop by a flock of sheep, moving across the road from one paddock to another. The farmer shifting them waved to us and walked over to the driver's side window. He and Aidan discussed sheep and I let my mind wander, not listening until I caught the words, Nan up tiger. I turned to listen to their conversation. Aidan laughed. You don't expect me to believe in the Nan up tiger, do you? That's just something you made up for tourists. The farmer shook his head. The Nan up tiger's real mate. It took two of my lambs last week and Pete next door said he's lost three. Pete's missus saw a slinking dark shape by one of the sheds near the house the night they lost two lambs. You watch out for it. I'm shifting my lambing ewes closer to the house, so the dog and I can keep a better eye on them. He waved again as he closed the gate behind his sheep. Aidan crunched his car back into gear and accelerated away. So, do you believe in the Nanup tiger? he asked, without taking his eyes off the road. I replied cautiously. It's a native species that's believed to be extinct, because no one's seen one for a long time, isn't it? With all the forests and big farms around here, anything could be hiding. It wouldn't surprise me if there are still some around, even if no one sees much of them. Aren't there plenty of undiscovered species in the world, even in Australia? What's one more? Aidan's laughter died. Some stories say it's a thylacine, some sort of big native cat, but others say it's a black panther that escaped from a circus. No one seems to know what it is. He looked nervously into the trees on either side of the road. I made myself smile. Well if you're scared of it don't go out at night then, I said lightly. He shivered and continued driving, this time in silence. 4. When we reached the hospital, my shift was over. I thanked Aidan for the lift and headed inside to collect my bag. I lifted the bag onto my shoulder without pausing and turned on my heel to head out the way I'd come. I heard the clink of keys inside and thanked Helen in my head, hoping I'd remember to thank her properly when I saw her next. Aidan was talking to one of the receptionists at the front desk when I stepped into the entrance lobby. Tired and unwilling to engage in further conversation with the intern, I crossed the lobby as quickly as I could to the front door. The automatic doors slid open to reveal darkness and rain. I didn't mind water falling from the sky, but I did mind the way my clothing stuck to me when I was drenched. Environmental water and clothing is a bad combination. It seemed far more practical to me to go naked in the rain. I braced myself for the uncomfortable restriction of my wet pants clinging to my legs when a hand touched my arm. Aidan stood beside me, screwing his nose up at the rain. It's times like this that I realize why I left Ireland for Australia, he told me with a big smile. Why did you leave Ireland then? I asked. For the beautiful, sunny Australian climate. He laughed and started to open an umbrella, again reminding me of an octopus. This time, the octopus appeared to be jetting through the water to evade something unpleasant, unable to find a rock cleft to hide in. I knew how it felt. After two or three tries, Aidan managed to keep his umbrella open. 
He waved his hand toward the raindrop-free zone created under its expanse. It's a golf umbrella, with room for two. I'll walk you to your car, if you like. For the second time that day, I permitted the intern to do me a favor. He didn't say anything while we walked to the car. I opened the door and glanced at the back seat, but the strong smell of cleaning chemicals alerted me before I turned my head. The reddened seat had returned to plain grey, much like the skies above and my own thoughts. Helen had truly taken care of my car and I doubly owed her my thanks. He waited without moving until I sat in the driver's seat. My fingers curled stiffly around the door handle to pull it shut. Come to dinner with me? The intern asked in a rush. I raised my eyebrows but didn't reply. His face turned red, making his fiery red hair look pale for the first time. I mean, if you want to, it would be really nice if you came with me to the pub to have dinner tonight. After a long day like this the last thing I want to do is cook, and your day was harder than mine. For a moment, I wondered if this strange man could read my mind. I'd intended to stop for some takeaway fish and chips on my way home. Perhaps it might be pleasant to eat in a restaurant for once, instead of in my small house by myself. I stared at him a moment, before I heard the words spoken with my voice. Okay. His face faded from red to pink to white and he smiled, looking slightly stunned. So, meet you at the Tangle Head? It took me a moment to remember, this was the name of a brewery, near the port. For the third time I replied, okay. 5. Two beers and a very filling meal later, Aidan admitted that he owed me. Why? I asked diffidently, sipping my beer. Your patient today should have been mine. If you hadn't been there, I would have stuffed up, and I don't know what would have happened. I'm terrified of babies. From his wide-eyed expression, I judged that this was not a joke but the truth. For the first time I smiled. How can you be afraid of babies? He looked embarrassed. I'm the youngest of eight kids back in Ireland. One of my aunties moved over here and married an Australian, so I came over to do my internship when I finished my medical degree. I've never delivered a baby and this one would have been my first. Mum never let me hold any of my nieces and nephews because she was afraid I'd drop the babies. I guess I got scared I'd drop them too. They're so tiny. He spread out his big hands, wide enough to cradle the premature baby I delivered this afternoon. Ah. I nodded, understanding. His fear was like that of most first-time fathers, or at least the few I'd seen. Most of the babies I'd delivered never knew their fathers. This was probably for the best. It was the ones who never knew their mothers that made me. I hurriedly gulped down the last of my beer as he drained his second. Coming from such a fertile family, he'd surely never experienced the loss I'd suffered. He wouldn't understand. We both stood up at the same time. Together, we walked to the cashier and paid for our meal. Outside the pub, he thanked me for joining him for dinner. I replied in kind and headed into the darkness toward my car before he could follow. My tears dripped silently to the blackness of the parking lot, unseen and unheard by any but me. 6. The following morning, as I sipped my coffee alone in the hospital cafeteria, the intern slid into the seat across from me. Do you mind if I join you? He asked with a grin, taking a slurp before clunking his own coffee cup down on the table. I shook my head, not lifting my eyes or my lips from the cup. Last night had been a long and lonely one, darker than most, given the memories Miranda had inadvertently stirred. I needed my caffeine more than ever. In fact, I was considering a second cup, if time permitted. The man seemed to be waiting for something, but he appeared too eager to practice patience for long. Look, I haven't been here very long and I don't know anyone. I was wondering if you could help me out with some recommendations on how best to live here in Albany, where to eat and buy stuff, where the best nightlife is, hell, I'd be incredibly grateful. 
I'd buy you dinner anywhere you like. I summoned a smile. I've only been here a few months myself. I hardly know where would be best to do most things and I rarely see much nightlife, unless you count kangaroos when I'm on early shifts. After yesterday I'd prefer not to see too many more of those. I suppressed a shudder but my smile evaporated. He seemed to understand, yet still he persisted. Even just someone to sit with for coffee and break times. You're the only person here who's spoken more than two words to me that weren't work-related since I arrived a week ago. His smile refused to fade. Please? I shrugged. Sit where you like. I don't mind. I drained my coffee and stood to make another. I decided I just had time for it. He reached for my cup. Let me get you another one. I need a second one too. I surrendered the empty mug. White one sugar. His grin widened. Same as mine. He strode away. I wondered what he saw in my company to attract him. It didn't matter. Whatever it was, he probably imagined it, and would soon realize this. I did not share his fear of being alone. For me, it was simply a way of life. 7. The ward was both busy and short-staffed. Too many had succumbed to early colds with the onset of the winter weather. I barely managed to get breaks for the remainder of my week, so in my brief time in the cafeteria I saw nothing of the intern. As always, busy periods are succeeded by lulls. I was granted a longer lunch break than usual when an influx of third-year nursing students invaded the hospital. The shortage of staff became a surplus that I was pleased to enjoy, however briefly. Lunch came with another unexpected surprise, the first harvest of winter vegetables was in. The menu board proudly advertised this, along with the return of the rainbow lasagna. I surveyed the colorful layered slab on my plate as I sat down at a table by the window, trying to work out what was in each layer. The red meat sauce I recognized, along with the pumpkin beneath it. The squash and zucchini layers I identified after a few moments, but the blue and purple ones left me mystified. I carved up a bite and forked it into my mouth, hoping the taste might help me. I admitted defeat as I swallowed, resolving to let it remain a mystery. I opened my eyes to cut another piece, still puzzled. Blue cheese and eggplant, the intern's voice murmured as his lasagna-topped plate landed on the table across from mine. I looked up in time to see him sit down. I asked the server at the counter, he admitted with a grin. Is it good? Slowly, I nodded. Then I get a double bonus at lunch today. Good food and good company. He shoveled a large bite of lasagna into his mouth. If he classed me as good company, I felt sorry for the man, but not enough to tell him so. I was certain he'd soon work out there were other staff who'd be far better company than I could ever be. Silence, sadness and all. My fork clinked against the plate as I cut another slice with more force than necessary, shoving it into my mouth before I said something. My mouth safely full, I dared to look up at his face again, meeting expectant eyes with surprise. Had he said something that I'd missed? Evidently so. His smile seemed to forgive my rudeness as he said, I just asked if you liked fishing because I seem to have found a really great fishing spot and it'd be a shame not to share it. Down near my house on the inlet, I caught a big fat brim fishing from the shore a few days ago. I thought maybe if you were free on the weekend, you might like to come fishing with me. He trailed off. I swallowed with difficulty, forcing myself not to choke. No thank you, I managed to say. I don't fish. Ah that's a pity, he replied. I could show you if you like. I have all the gear. All you'd have to bring is yourself. I'd even offer to scale and clean your catch. I shook my head strongly. No. I'm busy studying this weekend.
I hurried to finish my meal, yet I wasn't fast enough to head off his reply. Fair enough. He sounded sad. If you ever change your mind, just say the word. I shot up from my seat, my mouth full. I gave him a curt nod as I passed him, taking my plate to the dish racks in the kitchen. Longing rose up in me. I wanted to go fishing more than I could say, the taste of fresh fish haunting my tongue, but I wouldn't until I headed home. I had to finish my term as a student midwife and complete my exams before I could fish in the warm waters of home, for wahoo and tuna, Spanish mackerel and mahi-mahi. Big fish for which a brim was nothing but undersized bait. As I left the cafeteria, I noticed the intern speaking to the server and both sharing a smile. I ardently hoped this meant he'd found a new focus for his friendship. Perhaps another girl might find the burden of his kindness easier to bear. 8. We're short in ed. The agency has no nurses left and we've just had to admit one as a patient, when her fever ran too high and she fainted. The harried-looking Helen bit her lip. Please, if either of you can be spared from your ward for a few hours to fill in for the ed. She looked desperately at me. I exchanged a glance with Jill. We weren't busy, but if a patient presented, wanting a midwife, that could quickly change. Tell Dr. Henderson he can call on us in an emergency if Ed absolutely needs another staff member, Jill said finally. Helen's face crumpled. It's not Dr. Henderson. He's homesick too. The only doctor we have is that new intern. Jill's eyes widened. Did you ask the other wards? Aren't there some nursing students in the general surgery ward? We have nursing students too. What we need is an experienced RN. I owed Helen a favor for taking care of my car as I cared for Miranda. Perhaps this was an appropriate way to both thank and repay her. I'll do it. I'll work the full shift in Ed instead of here. Jill opened her mouth to protest. If we get any deliveries, I'll be the first to know and I'll bring them back to the birthing suite, I promised. Jill's mouth closed as she nodded once. I marched back with Helen to the emergency department. I hadn't worked in one since my days as a student nurse, but even then I'd enjoyed the challenge of triage and the sheer variety of cases that came through. We got all sorts in ed. A country ed was no different, though the lack of staffing made this one more chaotic than usual. I heard the screaming as I approached, quickening my step to a trot to reach my destination faster. The screaming baby in the waiting room had a broken arm and he'd been waiting for too long, judging by his mother's panicked expression. The man with the bloodied broken nose was drunk and would pass out soon, negating the need for pain relief if he waited much longer. The poor student nurse on the front desk had noticed neither of these as she was busy arguing with a woman whose young son was sneezing and sniffling, as she screamed hysterically that he had meningococcal and he'd die unless they admitted him, though he had no fever. Through the curtains of a cubicle I saw Aidan tending to another patient, but he'd taken to running his hands through his hair until it stood out in crazy, escaping tufts. His wide eyes were starting to show panic too, though his voice remained calm. All in all, the Ed was ready to explode. I took charge. The student nurse arranged the tests for the toddler with the paranoid mother. Better safe than sorry, I told her with a grim smile. I sent another student to man the desk and check that the drunk was okay to wait until the more urgent patients were seen to while I ushered the mother and her broken-armed baby into the children's cubicle. He climbed out of his high chair and I couldn't stop him. I only turned my back for a second but he was strapped in, she wailed. I said soothing things as I tried to examine the baby's arm. This one I needed a doctor for. Aiden, time to demonstrate your skills, I thought. As if I'd said his name aloud, the intern appeared at my side. The mother thrust her baby at him and he backed up as if the child was a live bomb. You should hold him, I told the woman instantly, taking her attention from the intern. 
He'll be more comfortable in his mother's arms, and the doctor will have both hands free to conduct a thorough examination. Aiden's change of expression from fearful to professional took barely a moment, so that I was the only one to see the change. How did it happen? Aiden asked easily as he examined the child, keeping his voice calmer than his panicked eyes until the panic faded. The mother's voice gradually calmed to match his, as she repeated her story. He nodded as he kept his eyes on the baby, whose noisy crying had quietened to dry sobs. I heard something clatter to the floor off to my right. Oh shit, a female voice said clearly. The clattering continued. If you'll excuse me doctor, I said smoothly to the intern, who turned startled eyes on me. Just sing out if you need any further assistance doctor, but it looks like you have this well under control without any need for me. I forced a professional smile for him and his patients. After a few moments, the intern responded with a grave nod. Of course nurse. He carefully avoided meeting my eyes. I turned away before he could change his mind and crossed to the reception desk. The startled nursing student stood transfixed behind the desk, staring at a ragged hole in the ceiling, and the furry creature scrabbling at the edge of the hole to regain its spot in the ceiling cavity. The bushy tail waved around aimlessly as the creature's claws dug into the ceiling foam, bringing down another shower of plaster, insulation and other debris that clattered noisily to the vinyl. The girl turned to me. What's that song you're humming? I hadn't realized I'd been making any noise, but I stopped the moment she mentioned it. Go get Tony, the maintenance man. Tell him another possum's punched a new hole in the ceiling in the air. I instructed. I paused. Do you know where Tony's workshop is? She nodded vigorously, her ponytail bobbing, and trotted off down the corridor. I stepped up to her place at the desk. The possum managed to find a claw hold to lift itself into the ceiling without widening the hole further. I caught a glimpse of a tiny hand in her pouch as the mother possum retreated into the roof space. We were spared a possum patient today. The drunk had slumped to sleep across the waiting room bench, his snores telling me that his broken nose wasn't impeding his breathing any. Behind me, the other nursing student marched off to pathology with the samples from the sniffling toddler. For a moment I breathed a sigh of relief. From chaos to calm, the emergency department was now under my control. 9. The student who'd gone to pathology returned with a smile for her patient, and a promise to call his mother when the results came back. As if on cue, the intern chose the same moment to release his patients too, as the baby with the bandaged arm smiled a teary smile at his mother. Aidan stood beside me at the desk, watching them leave the ed. When they were safely out of earshot he turned to me. What in hell did that? He nodded at the gaping hole in the ceiling. A surprised possum, I responded. I frowned. I sent one of the students for maintenance, but neither of them's back yet. I'll see if I can find them. I picked up the phone. Tessa, the secretary in engineering, answered after one ring. I asked after either the student or Tony, and was told Tony was fixing a tap in a patient's room. The nursing student had ventured into engineering and spoken to Tessa. Tessa had given her the room number, which she repeated for me, as I carefully wrote it on a notepad. Tessa promised to page Tony for me a second time, but I decided to go looking for the missing student and maintenance man. I'll be right back, I told the intern and remaining nursing student, who were both staring at the snoring drunk in the waiting room, their only remaining patient. Both nodded, but I wasn't sure if they'd heard. I shrugged and strode off. I'd barely be gone five minutes, which was hardly enough time for chaos to reinvade my ed. Clutching the paper in my hand, I kept looking at the room number. It was one of the isolation rooms, for contagious patients or those who needed to be kept apart from other patients for whatever reason. As I approached the door, I heard a quiet whimpering on the edge of hearing, as if someone inside the room was in pain. 
The absence of signs or even a name on the door told me there was no patient in there, so my first thought was that the noise came from an injured staff member. I pushed the door open, but most of the room was obscured by the curtain around the bed. The sound was louder now and definitely coming from behind the curtain. Worried, I edged around it, holding my breath as I followed the sound of the pitiful moans. I saw the student's bored face first, her chin resting on the bed. The moaning came from her mouth, but she didn't look like she was experiencing the slightest discomfort, let alone pain. Behind her, Tony the elderly maintenance man had his eyes closed and a blissful expression on his face. I looked more closely, not making a sound. The student's skirt was hiked up to her waist and Tony's pants garnished his ankles as he banged her from behind, oblivious to my presence. She saw me. Silently, I raised my eyebrows. She held out one of the hands she'd clenched around the bed frame, and I saw the $50 notes she held. Ah. This was her way of supplementing her meager student income. I touched my finger to my watch as a reminder that she had limited time for this sort of thing. She gave a tiny nod of acknowledgement. Come on Tony baby, she murmured in a little girl voice. Come for me before our time's up in two more minutes, and I'll give you a discount tomorrow. You can have me for my whole lunch hour for the same price as today. He went into a frenzy of thrusting. Fuck yeah. A whole hour for only 300 bucks? Here I blow baby. I retreated as quickly as I could before the rutting man saw me, but I heard his triumphant finale as I left the room. I wanted to feel sorry for the girl, feeling she had to sell her body to finish her studies, but she was making a handsome profit on the sale. I wondered if I'd do the same, under similar circumstances. I shrugged and dismissed the thought. A more important consideration was whether to report her to her supervisor. After a moment, I decided I wouldn't bother. After all, she wasn't one of my staff, nor my responsibility. And while she was working in the ED, emergency would be on top of the list for maintenance work. 10. Did you find Tony or Lynn? Aidan asked as I returned to ED. I nodded. He's coming. Right away, I believe. I maintained my composure and looked at the bench where the drunk had been when I'd left. Where'd he go? The door to the public toilets flew open and the man staggered out, answering my question. I want to go home, he slurred, touching a hand to his bandaged nose. The taxi pulled up behind him and beeped before anyone else could say anything. He stumbled outside to the waiting car. Tony turned up, a big grin on his face, as he repaired the roof and every tap he could get his hands on. With a wink to Lynn, he whistled as he left. Lynn kept her eyes on the floor. Belinda, can you help me with something in the office? Aidan asked with a brief look at the students. Call us if any more patients arrive. Both girls nodded, standing side by side at the desk. Lynn looked a little flushed, but the other girl didn't seem to notice. I followed Aidan back to the duty doctor's office, and he shut the door as soon as I'd joined him inside. How'd you do it, Belinda? You took over my Ed and had it running smooth as satin or melted chocolate in about 15 minutes. You even had the patients thinking I was in charge, though I knew I wasn't. How can I repay you? Let me buy you dinner. Please? His eyes held both admiration and desperation. Satin or melted chocolate. Unusual examples for smoothness or a hospital. I summoned an uneasy smile. I didn't do much. You took care of your patients and all I did was tell the nursing students what to do. Hardly worth a dinner. I'm just doing my job. You did a bloody amazing job. At least join me for dinner, even if you won't let me pay for it. Please, he persisted. I surrendered. Okay. His grin was fierce. The tangle head again, right after your shift finishes? 
I nodded. The restaurant had just taken a delivery of bronze whaler fillets I'd heard from the kitchen staff, and I had a taste for shark right now. 11. I agreed to meet him by the front desk at the end of my shift, before heading back to my ward. The ed was empty of patients, and I was only a phone call across the hospital, after all. The remainder of my shift passed without incident, so it seemed a very short time later that I collected my things and made my way back to Ed. Rob the orderly manned the desk as I approached it. He looked surprised. Is the intern around? I asked him. Rob's hands tightened on the edge of the desk, his knuckles paling to bone white. I haven't seen him for a bit, he replied with difficulty. My eyes darted around, looking for either the intern or anyone else I could ask. Movement in the reflective office window caught my attention. I heard Rob make a choking noise but I paid him no heed as I squinted at the window. Beneath the desk, reflected in the glass, little Lynn was on her knees with her mouth inside Rob's unzipped work pants. Against the rear of Rob's pants, Lynn's hand splayed like a sea star over the green rectangle I recognized as a hundred dollar bill. Busy night for the nursing student, I thought acidly, turning away to peer out into the car park. Perhaps he thought I would meet him outside? Or at the restaurant? Perfect timing, Belinda. Aiden entered from the corridor, his hair damp as if he'd just stepped from a shower. He changed his clothes too, making me feel uncomfortable in my work clothes. Should I go home and get changed too? I asked uncertainly. You look lovely already. I just wanted to look good enough to be seen with you is all, he replied with a wide smile. Behind us, Rob choked again, though it seemed like Lynn had no issue with swallowing silently. I shrugged and walked outside with Aiden. The students were now no longer my problem, nor his. Dr. Tan had started his shift, as had the night shift nurse. We parted to enter our own cars, then drove in convoy the few kilometers to the brewery. The restaurant was half empty this late on a weeknight, so it seemed no time at all before my steaming plate of battered shark landed before me. Aiden slurped his way through some ribbony pasta as I savored every bite of hot shark. I considered ordering another. Hell that was quick. Aiden laughed, nodding at my plate. I've never seen a girl enjoy her food so much before. I returned my raised hand to my lap, deciding not to signal the waitress for another serving if it made me appear strange. I'd return tomorrow to satisfy my craving instead. Without the observant intern. I excused myself, telling him I was tired, before paying for my meal and heading home. 12. A week passed. I passed Aiden occasionally in the corridors, when our shifts coincided. On those days, he always seemed to appear in the cafeteria on my breaks. He wouldn't sit anywhere but at the same table as I did. His lyrical voice inevitably burbled about something that made him smile. Only minimal input was required of me, so that's all I gave. I said little and gave away less, but his interest in my company didn't lessen in the slightest. I resigned myself to his company, for it was not so unpleasant. One morning his coffee clunked loudly to the table, the contents of the cup slopping around like the storm swell in the port that morning. I swear it's some kind of crazy conspiracy. Now the Nanup tiger's broken a man's leg, or someone's pulling mine. I looked up in surprise as Aiden slumped into the seat across from me. His hair was tufted and on end again. He took a slurp of coffee. For the first time he looked annoyed. How can an extinct creature break a man's leg? I asked calmly. Murray P.S., a dairy farmer from over Ellica Way, swore he saw a thylacine on his lawn, drinking from the birdbath. So he grabbed a camera and went out into the dark after it. The beast disappeared, if it ever existed at all. Murray stumbled over a tree stump or something in the dark and broke his leg. 
He managed to crawl back up to the house by morning to call for help. The ambulance brought him in. Aiden's brows met over his nose as he gulped down more coffee. I wonder if he got a photo of it. I mused. Aiden snorted, then choked as he got coffee up his nose. It took him a few minutes before he could do anything but splutter, so I waited without speaking. Do you honestly believe him? Or are you making fun of me too? I wet my lips. I believe it's possible he might have seen a thylacine, I replied carefully. But I'd want to see pictures or the beast itself before I'd believe it for sure. He looked hard at me, as if he was trying to decide if I was telling the truth. Finally, he spoke again. Thing is, if Murray really did see the Nanup tiger, it was headed toward my place. I live next door to him in Elica and it's all bush except where the house is. If the beast's out there it could be hunting my place at night, and it's just me out there. If you're so scared of the tiger, don't go out at night then, I replied lightly. Besides, it doesn't sound like the tiger was the real danger for Mr. P.S., but the tree stump he tripped over. Take a torch if you go outside at night and you should be fine. I do that already, Aiden grumbled. His expression cleared. You could come up any night you're free and watch for the tiger, if you like. A proper stakeout. Maybe we could discover an extinct species in my backyard. He looked hopeful. I forced a smile. No thank you. We'd probably just see a lot of darkness and no tiger or freeze if it's a clear cold night. I wouldn't let you get cold. I'd keep you warm Belinda, he replied instantly, the sound of longing in his voice. I surged to my feet, repeating my polite refusal as I headed back to the ward. While I walked, I wondered if I'd find time to speak to Murray P.S. about what he saw. Without Aiden, I suspected I could find the creature, if it wanted to be found. 13. I had five minutes left of my break, so I decided to detour by the general surgery ward, to speak to Mr. P.S., if he was up. The ward rest period was about to start, so he'd have no visitors. The murmur of voices in his room told me I was mistaken and he did have visitors, but the curtain round his bed wasn't entirely closed, so I peeped through the tiny gap. I could see the white sheet and cell blanket at the end of his bed, but that was it. To see, I'd have to stand right up against the curtain. If it really was a visitor, I needed to ask them to leave, but if it was another staff member, I decided I'd return later, when he was alone. I held my breath, stepping forward so I almost touched the cotton curtain. My eye to the gap, I surveyed the scene with some surprise. The murmuring formed audible words now, a litany of, yeah baby, yeah baby, yeah baby, as Lynn, her uniform dress hiked up to her waist once more, rode her cowboy home. Through the fabric of her dress, I could see the $50 notes folded into her pocket before I stepped back, not wanting to see any more. I hesitated, torn between the welfare of the patient and my desire not to be noticed. I'd heard that Mrs. P.S. had taken off to meet some American bloke she'd met and fallen in love with online, so Mr. P.S. was a very lonely man. Wavering, I turned and walked away. The naughty nursing student wasn't endangering his health, nor was he my patient. I returned to my ward where I found a new patient had arrived, swaying a blue streak with each contraction. Jill was helping her to the birthing suite, and I quickly moved to assist her. In the ensuing birth, I forgot all about nursing students, shagging patients or tigers hunting interns. A ten-pound boy was going to be born, without anesthetic, or so his mother insisted. It was going to be a long afternoon. 14. The morning sun shone through the cafeteria window, dust dancing in its rays. I just received word that Miranda and her premature baby had been allowed to go home for the first time. I smiled at Aiden as he sat across from me. He looked surprised. So you've heard the news about the mum and baby you saved? I smiled more broadly and nodded. Both are well and they've been released from hospital. 
He brought a hand out from behind his back, where he'd been hiding something. So we should have cake to celebrate. He placed two of the cafeteria's signature brownies on the table, the plates clinking as he set them down a little more heavily than necessary. He watched me nervously for my reaction. I smiled and laughed. Cake it is. Cheers. I lifted one brownie, bumped it against the other, before taking a bite of mine. The gritty cake was still warm inside. This would be wonderful with vanilla ice cream, I said, savoring the warm chocolate with my eyes closed. I thought of how my mother would enjoy this and resolved to find some brownies and ice cream next time I saw her in Perth. For the first time, I missed her. I don't think they have any, Aidan said quietly. I heard him crunch into his own brownie. I swallowed and opened my eyes to find him staring at me. I've known you for four weeks but that's the first time I've heard you laugh. His smile was rueful. I thought it was because my jokes weren't funny. I smiled to soften my words. I guess I just don't laugh much. I don't find many things funny anymore. He nodded, taking a huge bite of brownie. He had chocolate icing on his nose. My smile remained as I finished my brownie, thanked him and finished the rest of my shift, wondering how long he'd keep his brown nose. Perhaps a kinder colleague than I would tell him he looked like a wombat. I tried not to laugh when I met him in the corridor, perhaps an hour later. He still wore his wombat nose. I hadn't the heart to tell him about it. 15. The nursing student's last day dawned with audible relief from some of the staff, though I admit some of the male staff and patients were looking happier lately. Perhaps I was imagining it. To celebrate, the cafeteria announced that there would be cake after lunch, so it was unusually full on my lunch break. Aidan still managed to find me in the crush, sitting across from me with a plate of curry and rice that tasted nothing like the spicy dishes that passed for curry back home. Little Lynn sauntered past and I noticed Aidan's eyes following her. I bit back a smile as I wondered if he'd used her expensive services too. As if he'd read my thoughts, Aidan leaned over and hissed, You see the nursing student with the dark hair? I nodded once without looking at Lynn. I kept my eyes on the intern instead. I wanted to know whether my surmise was correct. She dot she offered to spend the night with me. At my house. She said it would only cost me $50 for the whole night. He kept his voice low, looking shocked. I thought of all the other men she'd shagged and how much she'd charged them. She must like you then, I replied. Like me? Aidan's whisper sounded almost hysterical. She wanted me to pay for sex like she was a prostitute. I heard she charged someone $300 for less than an hour. I whispered back. She must have liked you to offer you a whole night for much less. His eyes widened as he stared at me. She offered her services to you too? I shook my head, smiling slightly. No. Lynn was deep in conversation with her supervisor, the picture of innocent bewilderment. The supervisor's red face looked furious. The two women hurried past us and out of the cafeteria. Never, in all my years of teaching nursing, unprofessional behavior. I heard the older woman mutter. Aidan paled more than usual. Do you think she's in trouble for dot four? I nodded once before turning to stare at him. Why do you look so worried? Did you take her up on her offer? His face shifted from white to red into a deep bottle brush blush. He opened his mouth but no sound came out. He cleared his throat and tried again, hoarsely. I'd never, I, no. Belinda, you know I dot she. He swallowed and it looked like he found it painful. You're the only person I've ever invited up to the house. No one else? His eyes seemed to be trying to convey some emotional message that I couldn't decipher. I nodded. I remember. You invited me to come fishing and hunt the Nanup tiger. 
He looked sad. I'd ask you over for dinner, but I can't cook very well, so we're better off going to a restaurant if you want something to eat. We could always get a pizza or something. If we got a pizza from the place in town, it'd be cold by the time we made it to Elika, I replied smoothly, standing up. My break was over, along with our awkward conversation. So he hadn't used the prostitute services after all. Enjoy the rest of your shift. I headed off to do the same. Like the nursing students, my time here was coming to a close too. I felt a tiny tinge of regret, but banished it quickly. Once my exams were over, I could return home as a qualified midwife. Everything I'd worked for, complete. What more could I ask for? 16. Cake speeches, a small gift and plenty of coffee. It was my farewell morning tea in the cafeteria. My practical placement was over and my assessment came with a glowing reference. The biggest surprise was Miranda. I hadn't seen her since I'd helped load her into a plane five weeks previously. A sleep-deprived man had his arm around her and in her arms was her tiny sleeping daughter. We called her Felicity Belinda, Miranda told me shyly, as the man handed me a bunch of pink flowers. Good luck, beautiful serpent. What a name for a little girl. I smiled and thanked them both. I hailed the tiny child for as short a time as I felt was polite, before handing her back to her parents. As soon as I could, I intended to escape back to the ward to take care of patients. I didn't like being the focus of so much attention, particularly when I was supposed to blend in. I shook hands and smiled back at people until I managed to retreat into the corridor, where I bumped straight into Aiden. The crushed pink flowers sent up a heady cloud of scent. I'm so sorry, I wanted to make it to your morning tea but I had to finish my rounds and there was this kid in the ed who broke his arm. Aiden was at full speed in voice and motion. I smiled reflexively and told him there was plenty of cake. I walked past him, headed back to the ward and my patients. Wait, he said breathlessly. When's your last day? I stopped. Today, I answered. Have dinner with me again tonight, he asked anxiously. I shrugged. I had no plans and I intended to pick up some fish and chips again. Okay. I have to work till five but I know your shift finishes earlier. Can I pick you up? He sounded so eager. I agreed. I headed up the corridor to my ward, while he entered the cafeteria in search of cake. 17. Just before Aiden was due to arrive, my telephone rang. I didn't receive many calls, but I answered anyway. The voice on the other end told me that my replacement would arrive early the next morning, and could I make sure I vacated my accommodation by 8 a.m. tomorrow? I agreed automatically. We said goodbye and hung up. I'd intended to spend the following day on a boat, viewing the humpback whales in the ocean near the old whaling station. It didn't matter. I could leave early in the morning, before my replacement arrived, and have brownies with ice cream together with my mother tomorrow afternoon. I began packing up my few belongings. It didn't take long. Perhaps I should leave tonight, after dinner. Then we could have brownies tomorrow morning. I'd lost track of the time, so it came as a surprise when I opened the door to take my bag out to the car that Aiden was right outside. He looked shocked. Are you leaving already? Aren't you coming to dinner with me? I looked down at the bag in my hands. I just got a call saying I have to be out of the house by tomorrow morning instead of Monday, as I'd planned. So I figured I'd leave after we have dinner. Aiden's face lit up. You can stay with me for the weekend. I hesitated. I didn't want to share his house. It was difficult enough appearing normal for so much of my time, I couldn't manage it all day and all night. He took my hesitation for distrust. 
I know that sounds bad, but I'm staying at my uncle's friend's holiday house. It sleeps heaps of people. You'd have your own room at the other end of the house from me. It's not like I'm asking you to sleep with me. I'm just offering you a place to stay if you don't want to go home early. I found my voice. I did intend to go whale watching tomorrow. If I leave early, I'll miss out on the whales. I wavered in my desire to go back to Perth. I miss the whales so much, and they'd be carving soon. He perked up immediately. I've never seen a whale before. Do they really come close to here? I smiled. Sure they do. There used to be a whaling station where people killed them for their oil. It's closed now but the whales still come to the bay where it was. Come with me tomorrow and you'll see. The invitation slipped out before I'd seriously thought about it. His joyful smile beamed at me. So you'll stay with me for the weekend? Realization dawned that in my mind I'd already accepted his invitation. Okay. I reflected for a moment. I'll just put this in the car. Then I can head straight to your place after dinner. Aiden looked stunned. I wondered if I'd said or done something strange. Or I could come by in the morning. I suggested. His voice was breathless with the excitement that shone through his eyes. You can come over any time you like. Tonight or tomorrow. Whatever you like. I studied him for a moment. Tonight then, I decided. After all my bag was already packed. It was a simple matter to transfer it to the back of my car. I left the key in the meter box where it had been when I arrived. It would be as if I'd never been there. 18. Dinner was over in a blur of warm food, beer and very little conversation. You don't say much, do you? Aiden asked at one point. I concentrated on drinking my beer. I shook my head, drinking deeply. The less I said, the less careful I had to be. I put the beer down without finishing it. I'd need my wits about me tonight. Aiden dropped his empty glass on the table. Do you want to go, or would you like another drink? I shook my head. It's been a busy day. I'd like to go to bed early tonight. We paid for our respective meals and headed out to the dark parking lot. Aiden looked worried. My place is a fair way along the bay, so it's easiest if you follow me there. I nodded, then realized he couldn't see my response in the dark. Sure. Lead the way. We started our cars and I followed his taillights along the road to the west, along the bay. After several turns past a deli that was closed for the night, we turned onto an unsealed gravel road. I followed him, a little concerned at our remote location. He made a quick turn to the right, through a gap in the bush, and I turned behind him. In the beam of his headlights, I saw two houses set in a large lawn, which ended at the water's edge. I parked my car beside his and got out, shouldering my bag. Aiden fumbled with the keys, but managed to get the door open eventually. He entered first, turning on the lights, before holding the door open for me. I stepped inside carefully. I looked at the country-style kitchen, then through the long open-plan living area to the lounge with a big open fire. The wall on one side of the room was mostly windows, facing the inlet. The wall opposite this was a row of doors, which I learned led to the bedrooms. Pick any room you like, Aiden said quickly. He pointed at the one closest to the fireplace. That one's mine. For all that he was my work colleague, I did not know this man, so I chose the room furthest from his and closest to my car. I turned on the light in a room with a double bed and one bedside table. I dropped my bag on the bed and turned the light off again. Aiden stood outside my room, already pointing to the room next to mine. That one's the bathroom. There's towels in the cupboard if you need them. I nodded. I washed up in the bathroom as quickly as I could and brushed my teeth, 
before returning to my bedroom and shutting the door. After a moment, I pushed the bedside table across the door. No, I didn't trust this man. 19. I slept through the night, without hearing a bump of the door on the bedside table or much else besides. I pulled some clean clothes out of my bag and made my way into the bathroom for a shower. Aiden didn't seem to be awake yet, I saw his door was still closed. I turned on the shower, but the water had a slightly brown tinge to it, along with a smell that I associated with stagnant fresh water. This didn't clear, so I shrugged and took a shower anyway. At least the water was pleasantly hot. I dried myself and dressed, before venturing into the kitchen for breakfast. I'd brought some bread with me, so I used his toaster and some of his condiments to make some toast. I settled down on the sofa with my breakfast and a book I'd picked up from the shelf. The novel proved dull, so I was bored by the time I'd finished my toast. Wondering why any woman would want to count cigarettes and calories in her diary, I set the book back on the bookcase. I washed up my dishes and wondered what to do. The whale watching boat was due to depart in just over an hour. Should I drive up to the port early and wait on the jetty? A door creaked open behind me. I spun on the spot in time to see Aiden emerge from his room wearing a pair of silky shorts and a t-shirt, scratching his nether regions with one hand. His eyes widened when he saw me. I'm sorry I forgot you were here, he apologized, hiding his hands behind his back. He hurried into the bathroom and shut the door. He emerged soon after, crossing the living area in quick, wide strides. He disappeared into his bedroom, closing the door behind him. I heard him muttering to himself for a minute or two, before he emerged, fully clothed. Is this okay for whale watching? he asked. I tried hard not to laugh. I don't think the whales care what you wear. You might want to bring a jacket though, because it gets cold on the water. I pointed at my jacket and hat, on the couch beside me. Right? Aiden looked determined and marched back into his bedroom. 20. I agreed to let him drive to the port. I'd been laughing too hard at him in his ski clothes to see or drive. I'd never seen so much red tartan in my life. He'd switched the ski pants for jeans but the tartan hat and coat remained. I like tartan, he told me with a wounded look. I wasn't sure if he was serious or joking, but my levity slowly faded. We paid our fares and headed down the jetty to the whale-watching boat. Looking from the furled sail to the small cabin, I judged the catamaran to be a reasonable-sized vessel, about the same size as a male humpback whale. I wondered if we would encounter anything larger. There were only a handful of people on the boat, presumably owing to the cold, damp and windy weather. The whales and I didn't mind, Aiden was snug in his bright coat. The boat headed out of the port, toward the decommissioned whaling station. The vessel crew gave a commentary as we cut through the little waves, but I didn't listen to it. I suspected I knew more about whales than any of them. I stood in the bow of the boat, face to the wind, looking for the first sign of a blow. It had been many months since I'd seen a whale, Dot and I saw it. A blow of hot condensed air, a back curving above the surface, the dorsal fin. A humpback. There. I shouted, pointing. Aiden and the rest of the passengers crowded around me, scanning the water. I watched the patch of calm water between the waves disappear, before pointing again. There. The whale surfaced on cue. This time his tail rose up behind him as he dove deep. Wow. Aiden's voice behind me was breathy and awed. I turned and smiled before surveying the water again for another whale. The whale surfaced and blew around the boat, to the murmured oar of the other passengers. I looked closely but all I saw were males and juveniles, none of them as large as the boat. The skipper mentioned something about moving to another spot, where the spotters at the lookout had seen some more whales. The other passengers moved back inside as the boat started to move out of the shelter of the headland, 
but I stayed in the bow, dropping to my knees by the rail. Under my breath, I started to sing, so quiet it was barely audible to my own acute hearing. The skipper slowed and pulled out a little plastic flute, playing a short tune before pocketing the flute again. I looked out across the water to the horizon, repeating my song. I heard her approach, but still she surprised me. She spied above the surface, her face close beside the boat, her eye focused on me. A tiny back broke the surface next to her, followed by a tail barely bigger than a dolphin's. Her baby was so young it was still pale grey. I sang once more, and she dipped below the water again. I held tight to the rail at the bow as she breached beside the vessel, soaking me with spray as she twisted in the air and splashed down again. The boat rocked violently, but stayed afloat. A gust of wind chilled me to the bone. I couldn't stop smiling even as my hands turned pale blue. The other passengers moved out to the bow again, and we all watched as the whale cow breached a little further away. Murmured sighs echoed around me as the tiny back and tail flicked to the surface beside her. I nodded my thanks to her and shivered in the wind, wishing I'd thought to bring warmer clothing. I wondered if it was warmer in the water with the whale, than in the wind on the boat. If only I could slip into the water unseen to find out. Aidan was close behind me, but I didn't mind his nearness. He blocked the wind from one direction, if nothing else. I heard him unzip his coat, and wondered why he'd do such a thing in this wind. The answer came as he enclosed me in tartan, his arms lightly around me. I pulled away automatically, but stopped at the sound of his voice. Now he sounded in control. You're turning blue. You can share my coat or you can go inside and wrap up in the foil blanket from the boat's first aid kit. If you stand out here much longer in your wet clothes, you'll get hypothermia and I promise I'll get you admitted to hospital as soon as the boat docks. Whatever you choose, I'm not going to let you freeze. I'm not a very good one, but I am a doctor. I couldn't be admitted to hospital as a patient. I refused to sit inside when the whales were out here. That left me one option that was less repugnant than I'd thought. I struggled out of my own dripping coat and dropped it on the deck. My sweater and shirt beneath it were merely damp. I sank deeper into Aidan's coat until my back touched his chest. His breath tickled my ear as he laughed. I expected you to take the first aid option inside. The whales are out here, I said. As if on cue, the baby exhaled into the air and flashed its fin and tail. The whale cow lifted her back high, followed by a tail wider than the boat, as she dove deep and headed out of the bay. I farewelled her with my eyes. Aidan zipped up his coat again, this time with me inside. He was so warm. I was surprisingly comfortable in this strange man's arms, though a contributing factor might have been how numb I felt from the freezing wind. I didn't sing again and all we saw for the remainder of the trip were smaller humpbacks, surfacing and blowing as they had before. I didn't mind. This was enough. Now I wanted to go back to shore and find some dry clothes. As if the skipper had heard me, it seemed like no time at all before the boat tied up at the jetty again. Aidan slid out of his coat and put it on me. He carried my wet coat as he extended a hand to help me out of the boat. I stumbled, clumsier than I could ever remember being before, as I found my feet and legs were numb. Somehow with his help I made it to the car. I sat in the passenger seat, almost too cold to shiver. Aidan had to buckle up my seatbelt before asking me again in concern, home or the hospital? Home, I replied as loudly as I could. There's nothing they can do for hypothermia at the hospital that you can't do at home. Right. Right, Aidan told himself as he drove off. 21. I tried to focus on the road, but my vision wavered from blurred to clear. I felt the bumpy surface of gravel and told myself we were almost home. A kangaroo came out of nowhere, bursting from the bush on one side of the road. It cleared the bonnet of the car and hightailed off into the bush on the other side. There goes Lucky, Aidan said. I struggled to understand. 
The kangaroo's name is Lucky? Aiden laughed. Any kangaroo I don't hit is called Lucky. I smiled, or I think I did, but I was so cold I couldn't feel if my face was working correctly. Aiden kept shooting glances in my direction, his expression increasingly grim. He parked his car so close to the front door it was almost on the veranda encircling the walls. He bundled me out of the car and into the house. Once inside, he let go of me. I sagged on my feet, but I remained standing. His fingers manically combed through his hair, so it fluffed out in all directions. You should go get changed. Into some warm dry clothes. I'll start the fire and get the room heated, so you can sit out here on the sofa to warm up. He looked at me, more than a little apprehensive. Do you need help getting changed, or will you be okay? I smiled bemused. I think I can dress myself. I ambled toward the bedroom I'd claimed. Changing my clothes was harder than I'd expected, because my hands weren't as cooperative as I needed them to be. After some time, I managed to take off my wet clothes and put on some pants and a shirt. I decided I didn't need a bra, because it was pretty useless when I couldn't fasten it. Today I was glad my breasts were much smaller than Vanessa's, because if she chose not to wear a bra, it hardly went without notice. Quite the opposite. After some consideration, I pulled Aiden's tartan coat on over my shirt. This would hide my breasts if such a thing was necessary. I carefully picked my way across the tiled floor on numb feet. In the time it had taken me to get changed, Aiden had started a fire in the fireplace. The first big chunk of wood was starting to burn, orange flame darting around the edges, like small nibbling fish. I sat on the couch, focusing on the flames. Aiden moved from his crouch in front of the fire to the couch beside me. He helped me out of his damp coat, flinging a fluffy rug over my shoulders instead. He stood in front of me, unconsciously washing his hands without water or soap, I noticed with faint humor. Rubbing his hands from his forearms to his fingertips, as if scrubbing up for some delicate surgical procedure. So I take it you're not going well watching again for a while? Aiden's joke fell flat. I looked up to his considerable height, incredulous. Why would I avoid whales? It was the wind that took my warmth, not the whale. I wished I could tell this man why such a suggestion was so nonsensical, but I kept my mouth closed. I turned my eyes to the flame fish in the fire. Right? His voice was uncertain as he walked away from me and out of my sight. I heard him moving around in the kitchen, but I concentrated on the fire, my focus on its warmth. Aiden returned with a bottle and two glasses, clinking them down on the coffee table. He carefully broke the seal and poured a small amount of kelp-colored liquid into the bottom of each glass. He held onto the bottle, giving a sigh. I was keeping this for a special occasion. I guess medicinal purposes qualify as an occasion. He didn't explain his cryptic words, nor did I care for an explanation, so I waited for him to hand me a glass. Drink this. It'll help warm you a bit. I judged the quantity of liquid to be a large mouthful, so I took it all in one gulp. A mouthful of fire coral would have burned less. My eyes watered as if to put out the flames in my throat, but the effort was futile. I tried to focus on the bottle's label. Blinking, it took me a few minutes before I could see. Lime burner's single malt whiskey barrel strength, I read, before I had the use of my voice. What lime was I didn't know, but this drink would burn anything. What is it? I rasped. Aiden took a small sip of his drink. He held it in his mouth, as if savoring the burning sensation. Whiskey, he answered. He looked at the bottle carefully. Barrel strength. I'm sorry, I should have added some water. He placed his barely touched glass on the table and headed past me to the kitchen. He returned a moment later with a small jug of water a ridiculously small quantity to extinguish the fire from my drink. He lifted the jug to pour some water into my glass, but stopped before a drop landed. 
You finished it all? You shouldn't have too much, not before your body temperature goes back to normal. Aiden looked worried, but poured more of the whiskey into my glass, then a tiny trickle of water. He did the same for his own glass. He handed mine back to me and carefully clinked the two together. To your good health, he said gravely before taking a sip. This time I followed his example, taking only a tiny sip of the whiskey I now regarded warily. It was as I suspected. The water did nothing to stop the burn, but there was flavor amid the hot sensation. I thought I tasted honey and warm chocolate. I took another sip and ventured an opinion. This would go well with warm brownies and ice cream. My words surprised him. He looked like he was struggling to find a reply. I'm not giving you ice cream until you're warm again, he said finally. He set his glass down and knelt on the floor to stoke the fire. He placed several large chunks of wood in the fireplace, far more than I considered necessary. Perhaps he felt the room was chilly, or that I required additional warmth. He unfolded to his full height and crossed the floor to me. He placed a hand cautiously on my chest at the base of my neck, where bare skin showed above the collar of my t-shirt. I met his eyes with a question, but he didn't answer it. You're still cold, he murmured, concern creasing lines into his forehead beneath the crest of orange curls. I bit back the comment I wanted to make, that I would always feel cold to his warm hands. There were differences between us, that I couldn't begin to categorize. 22. After a considerable time, Aidan seemed to make a decision. Move over, he ordered, climbing over me onto the couch. I shifted to the edge of the seat, not sure where I was supposed to move to. Folding into the space behind me, he took hold of the fluffy blanket. Now lean back. I shifted back against him, and he gave the rug a flick so it settled over me. He rested his arms lightly on top of the grey fuzz. I drowsed in the warmth from him, the rug and the fire, until his voice interrupted my drift. You can't sleep yet, not till you're warm. I may be a bad doctor, but I do know what I'm doing. His words irritated me like the brush of a jellyfish tentacle across my skin. You're not a bad doctor. You're doing fine right now, I mumbled. I can feel my feet already. I'm not sure he heard. I should have taken you to hospital. His words were whispered with regret. I gave a snort and struggled to sit up. I wouldn't have let you. I'd have jumped into the water in the bay first. I closed my mouth and gritted my teeth, so I didn't say anything else I shouldn't. I reached for my whiskey and drank some more, hoping to burn my voice past redemption. If I couldn't speak, then I couldn't say anything else stupid. This was precisely the sort of situation I was supposed to studiously stay away from. Oh, to be able to swim away. I stared at the fire, willing its warmth into my very bones. But I can't swim, Aiden said, sounding hurt. Nor can I right now. My frustration broke some barrier inside me and I fell back against him, helpless with hilarity. You can't deal with a simple case of hypothermia because you can't swim? The man behind me turned rigid and his hands formed into fists. No, I'm not a good doctor because when I'm under pressure, I just freeze up and can't think. So I let someone else help my patient, because I'm terrified of stuffing up and making them worse. I lifted my arm from beneath the blanket, and laid it across his arm from his elbow to his wrist. I dug my fingers between his and forced his fist open. My hand was now warmer than his. Today, you took care of a patient with no help from anyone else. You know what to do. Maybe all you need is the confidence to take charge. I threw the blanket off and surged to my feet. The whiskey swirled in my head, but I maintained my balance. I headed for the kitchen and a large glass of water without whiskey. I downed the glass of water and chased it with another. Holding tightly to the bench with one hand to keep it from moving, I turned to face Aiden across the dining table. I'm hungry, I announced, and I don't think I can drive anywhere safely. 
What do you suggest? 23. Dinner was the result of a rummage through the freezer for anything we could throw on an oven tray. I don't remember the food because it wasn't memorable, simply edible. Dessert I remember, because Aiden had brownies hidden in the back of the fridge, and some ice cream stashed in the freezer. Ably aided by the microwave, we devoured warm brownies topped with vanilla ice cream, accompanied by another glass of Aiden's burning whiskey. When I stood up from the dining table I found I was unsteady, but I managed to stagger to the couch before falling gracelessly onto it. I watched Aiden take the plates from the dining table and dump them in the sink. His steps were more coordinated than mine, the whiskey affected him far less than it did me. Irritated, I spat out the question that burned in my mind. Why did you choose to become a doctor if you feel you're so bad at it? Aiden draped himself across the couch opposite me. He didn't seem phased. I didn't. I chose to be an engineer, but I couldn't get a job in Ireland. So, I went back to university to study graduate medicine, like my dad wanted. The study was easy and so was the practical stuff at first. It's not till now when people expect me to know what I'm doing and take charge, that I don't want to. Surprised, I didn't know what to say. After a moment, I asked the next question. So how old are you? 30 last birthday, he replied, his eyes on me. He looked as if he expected me to contradict him. I was surprised I'd thought he was younger, but he probably thought the same thing of me. When I said nothing, he surprised me for the third time with a different question. So why did you choose to be a midwife? Is it because you love babies? I wet my lips. Perhaps it was the whiskey or perhaps it was a growing respect for the man, but I answered him honestly, if not completely. I was pregnant once and my baby was stillborn. I wanted her so much, but she didn't survive the birth. I thought that if maybe I studied to be a midwife, I could help other mothers to avoid a similar tragedy. Aiden's eyes were big and round. What happened to her father? I was honest, if evasive. He was long gone before my pregnancy was showing. He didn't even know about her. I, I'm sorry, he said softly. He poured another drink and handed it to me. I wiped my weeping eyes with the heel of my hand, not wanting to drip salt water in my whiskey. I took a deep draft, savoring the burn in my throat. My head was swimming all by itself. A log collapsed in the fireplace and we both turned to look at the fire, which needed stoking. I tried to get up, but Aiden was both nearer and faster. He pushed the last remaining chunk of Jarrah into the fire, before heading outside with the empty iron basket for more fuel. A few minutes later, he returned, hefting a large load of wood. He piled the fire up with pieces of Jarrah, and unfolded a screen in front of it. When he stood up, his face was red and sweaty from his exertions. Is it warm enough for you in here? A considerable amount of warm inside air had swirled into the cold night each time he'd opened the door, so my first thought was to respond in the negative. His obvious discomfort made me hesitate. I should be okay, I replied after a moment. Maybe you should take your sweater off so you're more comfortable. My sweater? Aiden looked blank. You mean my jumper? Sure. He pulled the garment over his head, the t-shirt underneath coming off with it. I stared, my mouth wide open like a whale shark. I'd seen hairy men before but not a man with red hair all down his front, from his chest to the waistband of his jeans. Aiden's fiery chest hair had me mesmerized. I blamed the whiskey in my blood. 24. Aiden caught me staring. Have you never seen a man with hair on his chest before? He asked testily. I didn't know what to say. Not the color of fire, no, I said finally. He relented. Back home in Ireland, it's supposed to be good luck to rub a man's red hair like a leprechaun. 
He saw my confusion. A sort of mythical creature. He took a step closer to me, still shirtless. Go on. I was reluctant to touch the man at all, let alone his strange chest hair, but the hope of better luck for the future got the better of me. Besides, I felt I might offend him if I spurned his offer. I stretched a hand out, lightly stroking the wiry orange hair trailing down Aiden's stomach. He pulled away, doubling over. I drew my hand back. That tickles, he apologized. His expression turned to a broad smile. Now your turn. It took me a moment to understand what he meant. But I don't have any chest hair and it wouldn't be red, even if I did. Aiden's smile turned cheeky as he continued. No chest hair? You expect me to believe that? You must have some insulation, not to have frozen solid in the wind out on the boat today. I shook my head. None? Even if I did, it would be too fair to bring you any luck. I looked away and refilled our whiskey glasses, so I didn't have to look at him. I gulped the contents of mine down as quickly as I could. Go on. Aiden's eyes held a challenge. He turned his back to me and picked up the poker, shifting the logs in the fire to burn better. The man was a doctor. How many chests had he seen in the course of his profession? What was one more? I shrugged and pulled my t-shirt off. My frozen fingers had been too cold to fasten a bra earlier in the day, so my chest was now as bare as his. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Aidan's eyes were as round as two puffed up blowfish. The poker clattered to the hearth. 25. His gave a convulsive shiver and fixated on my face. I never thought you'd do it. We work together. I'll get done for sexual harassment for this. I can't. He reached for the fluffy rug and draped it across my shoulders. I waited, but he didn't finish his sentence. First you ask me to take my shirt off, then you panic when I do. And we don't work together anymore. I held his gaze. Aiden closed his eyes. What if I run into you at another hospital in the future? It's bound to happen one day. I'd never be able to look at you again, without thinking about. He didn't look like he was going to finish that sentence, either, so I finished it for him. Without thinking about my chest hair? I offered. His eyes popped open. For a moment, he looked like he was having trouble controlling his face. Then he exploded with laughter. A moment ago, you said you didn't have any chest hair. Now you tell me you do? I spread my arms wide, the blanket hanging down like a cormorant drying its wings. Judge for yourself. I can't have you wondering about my chest hair when you're supposed to be working. Aiden nodded gravely. Right then. He swallowed and his eyes traveled down my body. Is this what it feels like to be Vanessa, with men staring at her boobs instead of her face? This kind of scrutiny unsettles me. May I? Aiden raised his hand but not his eyes. I shrugged. He touched his fingers to my collarbone, tracing along my sternum between my breasts to my stomach. I held still. What's your prognosis? Aiden looked me up and down, meeting my eyes again. I don't know. You don't have any chest hair. But you look like a shag on a rock. He started to laugh again. A shag? I asked cautiously. I knew only one meaning of his word, and I didn't understand the reference to a rock. One of those birds that sit on a rock and stretch out their wings to dry. Don't you call them shags? He looked uneasy. You mean a cormorant? You're comparing me to a cormorant on a rock, I replied carefully. Aiden swallowed. Of course. Nothing else? I don't believe you. So you didn't just suggest that I sleep with you? His voice was firm. 
No. He wavered, judging my expression. Unless you want to, he said finally. I kept my tone level, my expression giving nothing away. And if I want to. Aiden's resolve crumpled. I need another whiskey. Do you want one too? I was thoughtful. Yes, I do. 26. I drifted to the kitchen as Aiden took his time splashing more whiskey into our glasses. I drank deeply from the tap, feeling the chill of the night air through the kitchen window, though the glass was closed. When I drank my fill, I hurried back to the warmth by the fire. Aiden held up the whiskey, glowing gold in the firelight. I crossed the tiles to claim mine. The floor felt like a heaving sea as the whiskey swirled within me, but I touched my fingers to Aiden's shoulder to steady myself before reaching for my drink. His face split in a wide grin beneath his ocean deep eyes. I think you've had enough. What'll you give me for it? The whiskey must have cost him a fair bit of money, so it seemed fitting that I paid for my share of it. I shrugged. What do you want for it? His smile shrank, becoming more thoughtful. You could start with a kiss. I looked into those yearning deep water eyes of a man who seemed all fire. It's been a long time, but I think I still remember how. I cautiously placed my hands on the sides of Aiden's face and touched my lips to his. His mouth was open, so the draft of his breath cooled my lips for the briefest moment before I pulled away. Fuck that. He strode to the coffee table and clunked the glasses down. His hands were empty for barely a moment before they were splayed warmly on my back. Belinda. That's not a kiss. I moved with him as he pulled me closer, one of his hands traveling up to the back of my neck, as the other drifted down to the small of my back. My nipples tightened as they touched the fiery hair on his chest, yet I leaned in closer still. He bowed his head as I tilted mine up. I wet my lips and parted them, feeling fear for the first time. Perhaps I have forgotten how to do this. This is a stupid idea. Aiden pressed his mouth to mine, layering our lips as we shared a breath. His smiling blue eyes drooped to show blue-veined lids as his tongue stroked mine. I haven't forgotten. This is new and I'm going to, I'm going to. His shoulders were smooth beneath my questing fingers, his lips warm and responsive as I deepened my kiss. I felt his chuckle rumble through both of us, though I couldn't see him with my eyes closed. He tasted of whiskey with a hint of chocolate, and I wanted more. Now that's a kiss. I opened my eyes to meet his triumphant smile, softening even as I watched. Wow Bell. What do I need to do for another one of those? Aiden asked, his happiness clear on his face. My heart swelled in my chest, like a froth of bubbles begging to be released. I laughed my merriment aloud. My smile matched his as I said, give me one. The second kiss was easier than the first, for my fear and reserve had melted clear away. Not the whiskey's fire in my blood. This fire is all mine. And I'm going to enjoy him to the fullest. I threw my head back to laugh, breaking his lip lock. His chest hair tickled my breasts, inflaming more laughter. Aiden looked at me, mystified. You're drunk, he guessed. I shook my head. Maybe. I don't know. Now isn't it my turn? His smile returned. No mine. A slow smile spread across my face. If you insist. 27. Aiden's hand seemed content to press me close against him. Mine explored his body, or as much of it as I could reach, but I kept coming back to stroke the fascinating fiery hair between us, sprouting between his nipples and trailing down in a narrowing ribbon to where his jeans started. My fingers itched to follow the fire trail to its end, but the hard denim guarded my way. I paused between kisses to catch my breath. Please take your pants off so I can stroke you, I wanted to ask him, but it seemed such a strange thing to say. I wasn't sure what his reaction would be, 
So my fingers stroked as I fixed my eyes on the offending clothing, wishing I could see through it. Can you blame me? Aiden asked. I looked up in confusion. You're beautiful, Belle. And a pretty fair kisser, as well. Of course you've got me excited. I shook my head. I was thinking that I wanted you to take your pants off. I smiled to soften my embarrassment, hoping he wouldn't be too shocked. He gave a snort and jerked his head at me. You first. Without hesitation I dropped my pants and kicked them aside. Standing in front of him, wearing nothing but my knickers, I looked up, a challenge in my gaze. Now your turn. The fervor of his kiss took me by surprise, almost as much as the suddenness of the kiss itself. His fingers wove their way into my hair, sealing our lips together as if he didn't intend to let me go. My hands fluttered at first until they came to rest on his chest, tickled by the tantalizing hair. He wouldn't bear all of it for me. Irritated that I'd done as he asked and yet he kept his jeans on, I tugged at the button, framed by a tendril of tempting rust-colored hair. Aiden's laughter was a vibration between us, but he kept on kissing me as his hands dropped to help mine. The button slipped from my fingers through fabric, as I heard the sound of the zip. Denim scratched my skin as his jeans grazed my leg on the way down. God Bell, you're full of surprises, aren't you? He murmured, his arms tightening around me so I could feel his body was as bare as mine. The slide of warm satin against my belly told me that neither of us was naked yet but I thrilled at the thought that we would be soon, with all that entailed. His arms around me as if he was scared I might slip away, Aiden stumbled backwards, pulling me with him in stuttered steps. A kiss, a step, a stroke of his tongue, another step, a breath, Aiden stopped as he backed into the sofa, holding tight to me as he fell slowly onto the seat, breaking my already soft fall with his body. His hands caressed me as his kisses grew more urgent. He circled my nipples with his thumbs, firm strokes that sent a shiver deep beneath my skin. A sound akin to a sob escaped from my throat, only to be silenced by yet another passionate kiss. I wanted more than kisses and somewhere more comfortable too. Something hard and bony pressed into my thigh, so I shifted and slid a hand down Aiden's body to persuade him to shift with me. My fingers touched his smooth shorts and slid further to the slit in the front where I met hot hard skin crowned with hair. Oh. Hey, you know what we say back in Ireland, right? Aidan asked dreamily, his hand closing around mine so all ten fingers were curled around him. If you rub a man's red groin hair, you'll have amazing luck in the bedroom. He helped me stroke him slowly once twice as if to demonstrate. I fought it but I found I couldn't resist. I burst out laughing and lifted my weight from him, placing both of my hands on my own thighs. Aiden stuck up from his shorts like a grass tree, though a grass tree on fire. His expression held shock and hurt, yet I still couldn't stop laughing. I climbed off him to stand beside the couch, trying to control my helpless laughter. I sucked in a breath, a gasp and another deep breath before I could form words. I don't know where you heard such a strange thing, but down here in Australia, it's stroking a lady that'll bring you luck in the bedroom if you do it well enough. If not, you'll be stuck stroking yourself. I burst out laughing again. Aiden's smile started to return. If that's how it works down under in Australia, I'll give it a go, he said. My hands shook as I lifted them to take off my knickers. I hesitated, then strode to the table. Lifting my whiskey glass instead, I knocked back the contents, the burn barely registering compared to the blush I felt rising to my cheeks as Aiden's eyes fixed on me. He looked like he was drinking me, much the same way as I'd drained my whiskey. The alcohol flew straight to my head, so I sat down to deal with the dizziness. Still he stared. Feeling self-conscious and slightly chilly, I reached for the fluffy blanket that had fallen to the floor earlier and pulled it over me. Aiden's voice surprised me. Don't bell. You're beautiful. I guess I'm still a little stunned. He knelt on the rug beside me and pushed the fluffy thing away. I let go of it, a little less nervous now. 
No one's ever called me beautiful before, I admitted. Then all the blokes you've been with before were either blind or stupid, he declared. I gave a small smile. You have no idea. He looked uncertain. There have been other blokes, right? I'm not your first. I laughed outright. No, you're not my first. I was pregnant once, remember? My smile felt tight as I tried not to remember. Hey, Aiden said softly, caressing my face with a kiss. I didn't mean to bring up stuff that had upset you. Let me help take your mind off it. He grinned. I may be a bad doctor, but I'm bloody good at anatomy. Are you willing to let me get my hands on yours? He reached eagerly for my chest, flexing his fingers. I ripped off my undies, flicking them aside with my foot as his hands gently closed on my breasts. Do your best, for I'd like to try for some Irish luck tonight too, I murmured, my hands doing a little stroking of their own. Oh Aiden. He chuckled as my thoughts settled on him and nothing else. Oh bloody good indeed. 28. I woke up on the rug in front of the fire, my head nesting in Aiden's lucky chest hair and the fluffy blanket attached to my leg by some sticky substance. I lifted my head a little to look around. My clothes were strewn across the floor, along with Aiden's. The fire had died down to smoldering coals, but the room was warm enough for this to suffice. Through the condensation on the windows, I could see that the sun had risen. I relaxed. I had no deadlines or pressing responsibilities today. I could sleep on the floor all day with this naked man and not feel I was shirking something except perhaps a shower. Aiden stirred beneath me. Bloody hell, the man's whole body was stirring. My thought drifted eagerly to what he could do with it. With me. I felt his lips in my hair and his fingers gently stroking my back. I knew it was too delightful to be a dream. You are amazing, my beautiful Belle. Aiden's lips touched mine in a burning kiss that felt familiar. How many kisses had we shared overnight to make me accustomed to his touch? Did it matter? I want more. I shifted on top of him so only my knees, shins and toes touched the rug beneath him. Skin on skin except where. Aiden gave a gasp. How do you feel about trying for one more time before breakfast? I feel like I'm on fire with a fierce blaze that has nothing to do with whiskey or the embers in the fireplace. I didn't say the words. I simply smiled and shifted my hips as Aiden sighed with pleasure. Ladies first, he murmured, his hands reaching for me. The next sigh of pleasure was all mine. 29. We were considerably stickier when we rose from the floor, and I longed for a shower to wash the sticky sensation away. I wished also for some medication to dull the ache in my head. What would you like for breakfast? Aiden asked with a smile, pulling on the red shiny shorts. I shrugged. I don't mind. I'd like a shower first. I started to cross the room to reach the bathroom. Would you like some company? I stopped and turned, wondering. I... I began, unable to complete my sentence nor close my hanging mouth. Aiden nodded as if he understood something I didn't and directed his eyes at the floor, his lips pressed together firmly as if he was trying to restrain laughter. After a moment he said softly, You enjoy your shower, Belle. Use all the hot water if you like. I'll make you some breakfast for when you're finished. I'll have a shower after we've eaten, when the tank's heated up again. He took a step forward. He reached out and curled his hand beneath my jaw, as if checking my heartbeat with his fingers. Cautiously, Aiden touched his lips to mine, opening them to prolong the kiss as I leaned in closer, my tongue darting out. Last night's passionate fire was nothing to the rapid acceleration of my heart rate now. From Aiden's response I knew he could feel my pulse racing beneath his fingers. His free arm closed on me as my own arms reached around him to pull his body closer. 
a furious flurry of lips and tongues that left me breathless and panting, yet still wanting more. My chin resting at the base of Aiden's throat as I paused for breath, I gasped out words without thinking. Yes, I'd like you to join me in the shower. Please. Aiden chuckled, stroking my hair as he said, sure. Give me five minutes and I'll come join you. The water should be nice and hot by then. He gave me one last lingering kiss and crossed the living room to his bedroom. Dizzy with excitement and adrenaline, I stumbled for the bathroom, longing to feel the flow of warm water over my skin and his. 30. I twisted my hair up in a knot on the back of my head, as the cold water hissed and patted into the bathtub, beneath the shower head. It was barely above freezing as I stepped into the spray, slowly heating until my skin warmed once more in the water. When steam rose to the ceiling from the shower rose, I turned to stick my face into the stream. A slight movement in air current told me Aiden had entered the room, for I didn't hear the door over the noisy cascade. His hands on my waist were warm as he pressed his body to my back, kissing my neck from behind. Beautiful Belle. You're so beautiful, he murmured. Aiden reached for the soap and worked up a lather of foam between his hands, rubbing the bar in front of me for what appeared to be an inordinate length of time. Clinking the bar back into its dish, Aiden's breath tickled my ear. For letting me share your shower, the least I can do is help you wash. His foam-filled hands cupped my breasts, gently massaging my skin until I relaxed against him. That's better. You were so tense it was like you were worried you'd sprout tentacles as soon as you touched water. Aiden laughed at his own joke but I merely smiled, closing my eyes as I enjoyed his caresses. My skin tingled as Aiden's soapy hands slid down my belly to the length of my legs, all the way down before all the way up to my bottom, until he reached for the bar again. With a handful of foam, Aiden's firm fingers smoothed the tension from my shoulders and down my back. As he reached around me for the soap again, he murmured in my ear. Stand with your feet just a little further apart. I slipped a little in the soap slick bathtub, so Aiden's arm closed firmly across my chest to steady me, holding my body against his. Now better balanced, I complied, my eyes on my toes as his foamy fingers reached between my legs and inside me. Without his strong support, I'd have crumpled to the floor, for my legs felt more like the consistency of gel and not bone, as his intimate caresses concentrated on the spots where I was most sensitive. And he knew he knew. The wordless cry I heard could only have come from my lips, but I couldn't remember uttering it. I could only focus on Aiden's hand as a louder cry tore its way out of my throat. I tensed in anticipation. Relax, Belle. I've got you. As if to illustrate his point, Aiden's arm tightened across my breasts as his fingers drove deeper. My voice sobbed his name not once but over and over, my tipped back head resting on his supportive shoulder. I couldn't stifle the hoarse scream that ripped from my throat, for only a moment before it was muffled by Aiden's mouth as he bent his head to kiss me, his hand clenched between my trembling thighs. I lifted my head as we both loosened our respective grips. I turned to face him, still lost for words as sensation lingered. Aiden's face looked as stunned as I felt. God you're full of surprises Belle. I almost came just watching you. Not just watching my sluggish thoughts stirred. Stroking and circling, sliding and slipping, strong hands that sensed every stutter in my breath, every shiver of my body. I groped for the soap, not sure what I was going to do with it, but determined to at least attempt to respond in kind. Irish luck, I murmured, one hand reaching for him as the other closed on the softened soap. I was so intent on stroking Aiden to his increasing pleasure, that I dropped the bloody bar into the bathtub. Bugger, I muttered, bending over to pick up the soap. 31. In my clumsiness, I almost slipped again, saved only by bumping into Aiden's body. His hands at my hips steadied me as I reached for the bar again. Belle, do you want me to, he began, but didn't finish. It's all right, I think I have it, I interrupted brightly, straightening with soap in hand. I worked to lather it to foam as fast as I could, 
turning to take my chances with his Irish luck. No longer a grass tree on fire, now he resembled a sentinel stone, surrounded by frothy sea foam from waves breaking at its base. A rock warmed by sun and the water that washed him. I paused to admire my soapy handiwork, but he shrank before my eyes. Fuck he swore. Sorry Belle, that's the last of the hot water. He squeezed past me, wincing as he rinsed his body in the now near freezing water, before turning the taps off. Aiden stepped out of the shower and reached for the towels, tossing one to me. The fabric felt warm, as if heated. I looked at him in surprise. He laughed. Heated towel rail. Otherwise they wouldn't dry in this weather. Now if you want to turn shrinkage into swelling again, a little stroking should fix me, what with your warm hands and all. He moved in closer for another kiss. I felt him stiffen slightly in the close contact. He evidently felt it too. See? You work wonders, Belle. I smiled, unsure what to say. My stomach betrayed me with a gurgle. I was hungry for several things at once. Aiden laughed again, responding with a lighter kiss. I should make you some breakfast first. I wouldn't want a wonderful woman like you going hungry. He hung his towel back over the heated rail and walked naked out of the bathroom. The muscles in his bottom shifted with each step, revealing a tantalizing tuft of red hair between his cheeks. I hastily did the same with my towel, so I could follow. After the steamy atmosphere in the bathroom, the chill of the kitchen struck me more forcefully than the cold water. I felt my breasts tighten as if they too were shrinking away from the cold. I reached for the nearest item of clothing, Aiden's coat, draped over one of the dining chairs, and slipped it on, holding it closed with my crossed arms. Aiden stared at me as he donned some clothing too, a flowery apron that covered his front but left his bottom bare. How about I fry you up some eggs for breakfast? he asked with a wicked smile. He bent over to remove a fry pan from a low cupboard, and I found myself staring at his bum and what dangled so temptingly beneath. Should I help? I asked doubtfully as he strode around the kitchen, pulling out implements and ingredients. I can make you breakfast, Belle. You relax. Aiden smiled. I sank into a dining chair, pulling my knees up to my chest to keep more of me warm inside Aiden's coat. I was so intent on Aiden's nether regions that I didn't realize his eyes were fixed on me too. I smiled, embarrassed but rueful. Aiden shook his head. I still can't believe you're sitting in my kitchen wearing nothing but my coat, letting me make breakfast for you. I feel like I'll blink and you'll disappear. Me either, I admitted. He flipped eggs onto plates, salting them liberally before passing me some cutlery and an egged plate. I swallowed the eggs as quickly as I could, barely tasting them until my stomach was sated. I craved a different sort of satisfaction and my eyes strayed to the likely source of it, so the finger he slipped inside me beneath the table took me by stunned surprise. I straightened and tightened as Aiden slid his finger out again, with more difficulty than it had entered. Still so wet I see, he said. Cutlery clattered as I dove for him, intent on finishing what we'd started in the shower. Beneath my fierce kisses, he murmured words that I didn't hear until his hands pushed my breasts away. Bed. Belle, I'd like to take you to bed. I shed the coat and stood as he struggled out of the apron. Kissing and stumbling, caressing and gasping, we crossed the living area to his bedroom. The bed pressed against the backs of my legs, and it took only a slight push to tip us both onto the slippery sheets. Red satin, like last night's shorts, I thought incoherently, my hands sliding over the fabric as Aiden's fingers were far more productive. I could feel the ripples building for another powerful orgasm as Aiden asked, What do you want, Belle? How do you want me? I crossed my legs around his hips, my feet pressing insistently against the bum I'd admired over breakfast. My voice came out in a sob. In me. In me. No. Oh Aiden, Aiden. 32. 
Some time later, when the sweat-saturated satin stuck to my skin and our Irish luck had well and truly wilted, at least for a few hours, Aidan assured me, I lay beside him. My heart still racing as I tried to catch my breath, I couldn't resist Aidan's kisses as he lightly stroked my skin. Thank you, my amazing beautiful Belle, he murmured, stretching as his head hit the pillow beside me. Shouldn't I be thanking you? I responded lazily, my skin feeling pleasantly raw in places from the frenzied friction of our lovemaking. His laughter shook the bed. I'm pretty sure you've expressed your loud appreciation already. I blushed, feeling my already warm cheeks grow hot. Am I too noisy? I whispered, mortified. Aidan turned, his face hovering above mine. If you screamed for joy at the top of your lungs every time you came, you'd never be too loud for me, Belle. You'd only make me want to hear you scream again. He kissed my neck, lifting his leg to stroke mine beneath his. His caresses had very little effect on him, nor did my hands help. He sat up. A couple of hours, Belle, and I promise I'll be ready for you again. Is there anything you'd like to do while we're waiting? He seemed on the cusp of saying more, but he didn't. I shook my head, contenting myself with stroking the length of his red chest hair from top to glorious bottom. On the Sundays I'm not working, I usually go up to the distillery for lunch. Taste a whiskey or two and have something to eat. He trailed off, his mouth still open. A moment passed before he continued. I'd love to take you out to lunch, if you'll let me. I think you'd enjoy tasting the whiskies too, if you liked the one we shared last night. He looked worried. But if you don't want to. I reflected. I think you're right. I would like to. I summoned a smile that came easily to my lips. But I think I'll need another shower and some clothes. Let me help you, Aidan offered eagerly. I shot him a questioning glance. His smile was broad, though I didn't trust it entirely. Oh, this one will be very clean. Plenty of soap and this time we'll be in and out before the hot water runs out. Aiden promised. Trustworthy or not, I shrugged. I wanted this man's hands on me. Whether his intentions were dirty or clean were of no consequence. 33. My skin tingling from Aiden's thorough ministrations in the hot water, I reluctantly dug out some clean clothes from my bag. I pulled on my knickers and I stretched my arms behind me to fasten my bra when I noticed Aidan standing in the open doorway, for I no longer saw any point in hiding from him as I dressed. His appreciative smile widened when he knew I'd seen him. Rid, he said, gesturing at my matching underwear. I like it. I smiled. Me too, I admitted, holding up the similar colored shirt I planned to wear over my ruddy underwear. Aidan reached for me as he took slow steps into the room. His hands cupped my breast through the cloth. You're irresistible in awe on red satin bell, he murmured before he kissed me. After some minutes when all too soon we broke for breath, Aidan took the shirt from my hand. You should put this on or I won't be able to keep my hands off you. He helped me pull it over my head to cover my bra, before curling his hands around me again. Does it help? I asked with a smile. Aidan's expression wavered for a moment before he replied, No. I know what's under your shirt and I can't stop thinking about them. I'll just have to try to restrain myself. My laughter bubbled up and out, at the sheer determination in the man's expression. It's all right, I said suddenly, realizing as I stared at his shirt. I'll be restraining myself from stroking your chest too. Both of us laughing now, Aidan folded me into a more than welcome hug. Ah Belle, he whispered, touching his lips to my hair. You should get some pants on so we can go, or we'll be here like this all day. We exchanged a lengthy glance as we undoubtedly shared the thought that an all-day embrace was hardly undesirable. You'll really like the whiskies and the food's good too, Aidan said half-heartedly. My stomach made its presence known with an obscene gurgle. 
Ah, don't let me be so selfish, keeping you from eating lunch when you're hungry. Here. He reached over and snagged my jeans from the bed. Put these on and some shoes and we'll go. Reluctantly I pulled the jeans on and fastened them, slipping my feet into my shoes so I'd be ready. I took a quick glance at my reflection and realized what I'd forgotten. Wait. I just need to brush my hair. 34. Time turned tangled seaweed to smooth satin that Aiden wanted to stroke. Instead of restraining my hair as I normally would in a knotted bun or braid, I left it loose down my back. As if I needed more encouragement, Aiden kept murmuring, Beautiful. Just beautiful, Belle, each time he reached out to touch my curtain of hair. Do I look okay? I asked concerned. Aiden looked me up and down as I scrutinized his clothing. He wore the same as me, jeans and a shirt, covered by a thick jacket. I cinched the belt of my coat tighter around my waist, avoiding the intensity of his gaze. His scrutiny still made me feel nervous. Like I keep saying, you're beautiful, Belle. No one will notice I'm there if I walk in with you. Aiden held out his hand and I took it. Let me drive. That way you can drink as much as you like and I'll make sure you get home. Well to my home at least. We headed out to his car. The seat still smelled of salt from my soaking yesterday. We encountered no kangaroos on the drive, though the birds seemed out in force, fluttering through the watery sunlight filtering through the trees that lined the road. He slid the Mini into the last spot in the parking lot. I hesitated, looking around, wondering how many of the townspeople would be inside the distillery building. Aiden's arm snaked around my waist, clamping me to his side. It's all right, Belle. There'll still be plenty of food and whiskey left. Still uneasy, I walked stiffly inside with him. The room was packed. Bar stools, tables, chairs and sofas were all occupied by people. A fire rippled like a wave in the heater, flickering orange and blue through the sooty glass, and the room burbled with conversation and laughter. There was no place for us except at the tables on the veranda, in the cold air outside. I slipped from Aiden's embrace. I'll go find us a table, I said, gesturing toward the veranda. He nodded, pressing his lips together as if he was trying to squash unsaid words or laughter between them. I'll get you a drink. Anything particular you'd like to eat? He waved his hand at the menu. I shrugged. I don't mind. Whatever looks good. I meant it to. With so many people around, I wasn't sure I'd taste a bite. I'd be watching them too warily, wondering and worrying and wishing I wasn't part of such a crowd. I crossed to the veranda door and found a table on the decking that was half hidden from the window, sitting so I'd be out of sight to the people inside, but in clear view of the door when Aiden walked through it. The sun touched my hands on the table, a faint whisper of warmth when compared to the wonderful man I waited for or the whiskey he'd bring me. Belle? What are you daydreaming about? My eyes flew open to see Aiden smiling at me, glasses in hand. I smiled right back, able to be completely honest. For once I had nothing to hide. You. He set the drinks down and leaned across the table for a kiss, his tongue lightly caressing mine. He tasted of whiskey already. I'm sorry, I started without you. Just a sip, he said, the slightest of apologies in his eyes. I looked at the glasses on the table. Somehow, I had a lot of little ones, held together on a wooden board, not a single large glass like last night. Aiden had a similar board of glasses before him. A tasting paddle, Aiden offered. With slight samples of what they have available for sale at the moment. We can enjoy these until our lunch is ready. He touched a finger to the tiny glass on the right end of the platter. This is M79, the one that set you on fire last night. I looked into his eyes at these words, eyes of blue fire, like the flame on the gas stove he'd cook my breakfast on. 
Unlike this morning, I restrained myself to another kiss across the table, without throwing the rest of my body after it. When I slowly pulled back I replied, then I'll keep that one till last. Talking about each glass as if it held fruit, grain, herbs, smoke and soil instead of golden brown liquid, he pointed out which to try. Try as I might, I couldn't taste all of the things he described in each glass. I'd never eaten soil nor smoke, but I didn't like those that supposedly contained them either. Yet after each glass was empty, I found I preferred the taste of the contents on his tongue, in yet another tabletop kiss. When only one tiny glass of fire remained, a woman brought a tray to the table, containing the food Aiden had ordered for us. The tantalizing smells wafting from the plate set my stomach complaining once more, so I took a fork and seized the nearest morsel to pop into my mouth. The wine-colored slice of sausage proved spicier than it first appeared, so I coughed and choked until I reached for a glass of water to extinguish the unpleasant fire. I came up dry. There was no water, only the whiskey I wanted for later. I staggered to my feet and coughed out something about getting a drink, pointing vaguely in the direction of the bar. Are you okay? Aiden asked, worried. I smiled and nodded between coughing as I tried to hurry inside. At the bar I had to wait behind some people who were tasting their way through paddles like mine. With some curiosity I watched them as they cautiously sipped each glass. The women pulled faces, but the men seemed to be practicing blank expressions with each mouthful. I wondered whether it was the whiskey, or the women, that made them behave so strangely. Still I waited. After some discussion, one of the men bought a bottle of whiskey, wrapped in a paper bag and tucked under his arm, as the group strode out of the distillery. I stepped up to the counter. I'd like a big bottle of water and a bottle of the last whiskey, on the tasting paddle. The last one? M79. The prices are here, the barman said smoothly, pulling a sheet of plastic-coated paper toward me. He turned away to find a bottle of water and some glasses to go with it. He clinked the bottle and glasses to the counter, then looked at me expectantly. My expression mirrored his as I waited for the whiskey bottle. And the whiskey? I asked hoarsely. He hesitated. You did see the price, he said as he pointed at the last line on the page. The number on the end was close to my weekly salary from the hospital. Perhaps I should have hesitated too, but I knew Aiden didn't earn much more than me. And he'd chosen to share his expensive bottle of whiskey with me last night. The least I could do was replace it. I glanced at the window where I could just see Aiden's back as he sat outside, waiting for me. He looked lonely. Silently I extracted my credit card and held it out. A bottle of the M79? The barman asked again, just to make sure. I nodded once and extended the card further. Perhaps if I replace the bottle, he'd permit me to have a little more of the first bottle tonight. The barman bustled around, pressing buttons on the little machines to process my payment, before handing me the bottle wrapped in a brown paper bag. With another glance outside, I tucked it into my bag. I'd surprise him with it later. I picked up the water bottle and glasses, stepping slowly to the door outside. 35. What are you doing sitting out here alone? You should come join us. I recognized both Jill's voice and the woman herself, even though she wore her casual clothes and not her hospital uniform. She blocked the doorway to the veranda. Ah, I'm... Aiden began, half turning in his seat to face her. Jill nodded slowly. She left for Perth early yesterday. Cleared out of the house without a trace. Forget her, Aiden. She's gone. Aiden's face twisted, as if he wasn't sure what to say or what expression he should wear. My heart twisted too in response to his obvious pain. She's the Ice Queen. Calm and collected in the most stressful of procedures, but a heart of ice in everything else too. She was too cold for you to touch Aiden. You should come inside and join us instead of sitting here alone. Me. 
The Ice Queen was me, a name I'd heard used for how precisely I could handle a difficult birth. It meant more than I'd thought. Cold that could shut out Aiden. Not anymore. I pushed the door open wider, excusing myself as I slipped past Jill with my eyes on the ground. There you are Belle, Aiden said in relief. I lifted my eyes to his face and met his relieved smile with my own much warmer one. Too cold for him to touch. Don't you dare say that about Aiden. I leaned down to kiss him as my hands placed the glassware on the table. His lips touched mine in what he seemed to think was only going to be a perfunctory peck, but I persisted, lips parted and tongue poised until he realized I had something more passionate in mind. A minute or maybe three passed before I pulled away, to the sound of Jill's uncomfortable cough. I turned to face her, my hand clasped tightly in Aiden's. We sat outside because it was a bit too crowded inside, and we wanted to be alone for a bit. I smiled down at Aiden, the look in his eyes returning every drop of my warmth for him. Jill sounded uncertain. Well, there's space for you inside if you two want to come in and join us. She retreated inside to the fire. I kept hold of his hand as I slid into my seat. With my spare hand, I took another piece of the spicy sausage and popped it into my mouth. Now I was prepared for it, the burn was barely perceptible. Aiden snorted and poured us each a glass of water. He gulped his down before saying, you should try some of the chicken too. And the spring rolls before I eat them all. I did as he suggested, but I barely tasted any of them. I ate until I was full. All that remained was the chocolate whiskey. Aiden didn't say a word till I'd finished eating. He just watched me with a rueful smile on his face. When I was done he asked, would you like to go inside by the fire with everyone else? His eyes held yearning but also understanding. He wants to go inside to the room full of people. I hesitated. I... I usually sit on the sofa near the fire, most of the other regulars are happy to let me have the same spot, every week. We can sit in a corner as far away from everyone as possible if you like, or we can claim my spot by the fire. If they won't make space for you, you can sit on my lap. He grinned wickedly. I felt lost. I didn't want to go inside and be the center of attention. Somehow Aiden understood. Or we can stay out here in the cold if that's what you want, he added gently. Let's have the last sip of whiskey. He lifted his tiny glass and clinked it against mine before taking a sip. I don't like the cold and I want to be warm with him. Wherever that may be. I looked up into his eyes as I drained my glass. Chocolate fire on my tongue, I leaned across the table to kiss Aiden again. I didn't want the kiss to end. But it did as his cold fingers touched my neck. Let's go inside, my voice said of its own volition. I want your hands as warm as they were on my skin this morning. I pushed away from the table and stood up, stepping forward to stand by Aiden's side. He curled an arm around me and kissed me briefly. Thank you Belle, he murmured. My heart swelled. You're welcome, I said slowly for the first time. His arm a comforting weight around my waist, I led the way inside. 36. As Aiden's hand rhythmically stroked my hair, I leaned my head against his shoulder and let my mind drift. Conversation washed over me like waves on a beach, but no comments were addressed to me and I had no opinions I wished to express. I was content, for the first time in as long as I could remember. Did you catch last night's footy game? The Barkers lost two lambs last week. The wife will be at me if I don't chop some more wood for the week. I'm thinking of trying a sour mash, like the Americans do. Not sure what I'll call it. The Tans got a new Land Cruiser yesterday. So you never did tell us what happened to that midwife Aiden, a voice said, bringing me back to the conversation. I looked up to meet Aiden's eyes, gazing down on me. He bowed his head to kiss me before he answered, his eyes not leaving mine. 
She warmed up to me after a while, he said softly with a broad smile. I felt my own lips lift to match his. I sat up straighter, and we shared a longer kiss, oblivious to the questioner or his conversation. I heard the veranda door squeak open, but I didn't turn to see. I'll go get some more wood for the fire. Wouldn't want you two lovebirds getting cold. The door squeaked again until it banged shut. People began to murmur goodbye to Aiden, and slowly shuffled toward the door. Aiden responded to everyone by name, while I summoned a smile and a nod for each one. My smile didn't seem so stiff anymore, surfacing easily and staying on my face. Soon it was just Aiden and I left. Should we go? I murmured, raising my eyebrows. Aiden shook his head. Ben's getting more fuel for the fire. We should at least wait till he gets back. As if on cue a voice from behind me asked, where's Ben? Outside getting more wood, Aiden replied. That shouldn't take him more than five minutes. How long's he been gone? Aiden shrugged. Maybe twenty. The barman crossed the room to the door. I better go find out what's taking him so long. The door banged behind him. Just us. I smiled at Aiden, whose hands began to caress more than my hair and my face. His kisses turned more passionate too, with no intention of stopping soon. Running footsteps on the veranda ended in a protesting squeal as the door was ripped open. Dr. Aiden, the man gasped between breaths, both hands clamped to his chest. Then? Need a doctor. 37. I leaped to my feet before Aiden, my hand closing over his to pull him up beside me. What happened? I asked urgently, striding behind the man as he led the way to the woodshed. I didn't let go of Aiden's hand, and I heard his stumbling steps as he followed us. I don't know, he said. I went in and he was just lying there. He's dropped a load of wood all over the floor and he's lying on the ground. I came straight back here for help. After all, Dr. Aiden's closer than the hospital. I glanced at Aiden whose face had gone pale. His hand tightened on mine as he realized he'd have an emergency to deal with, the one thing he hated most. I started humming under my breath, the song a soothing lullaby I'd wanted to sing to my daughter. The same song I sang when I drove my car with Miranda bleeding in the back. It helped to calm me, if nothing else. Aiden's grip loosened and his strides lengthened so he walked beside me instead of following behind. Both my hands free, I automatically twined my hair into a knot on the back of my head. Practical once more. We approached the open tin shed and stopped. The barman lifted his hand and pointed. He's in there, lying on the floor. He didn't seem to want to go back in the shed at all. I glanced at Aiden again, taking a step forward, but he got there first, ducking his head to go inside. I skidded inside behind him, moving out of the doorway so I wouldn't block the light. I heard his breathing as soon as I stopped moving, so I knew Ben was alive, but he lay on the ground, his eyes open and unseeing. Aiden knelt beside him, checking for head and spinal injuries or some sign of why the man was paralyzed. I edged around the two men, searching the woodshed. Big chunks of timber were scattered on the floor, as if they'd been swept from the carefully stacked pile that took up more than half the shed. Movement caught my eye and I stepped closer to see better and make sure. What's wrong with him? The barman asked nervously, sticking his head inside the shed door. I don't know, Aiden murmured at the same time as I said, snake bite. The barman burst out laughing. When it's near freezing outside? The snakes are all asleep, too frozen to bite anyone. Can you get the first aid kit from inside, Mark? Aiden asked quietly. And call an ambulance too, mate. If he's not conscious, we need to get him to hospital. If they want more details, bring the phone out here and I'll fill them in on what I know. Sure, Dr. Aiden. The barman grinned and trotted off. Bell? Aiden began. I shrugged. 
I'm a midwife, a nurse. You're the doctor. They expect you to take charge and you are. They won't listen to me while they have you. No, he said urgently with a firmness in his tone that made me stare at him. Why snakebite Bell? Check his hands, his wrists, he didn't wear gloves and she was probably asleep in the wood. I think he woke her up and she defended herself, I replied. Aiden stood up, looking around in panic. But where's the snake? I touched the toe of my shoe to the block of jarra nearest me, a striped tail just showing beneath it, stirring sluggishly. She's here, trapped under some wood. Aiden's eyes were wide. What kind of snake? I turned my head to look more closely at her. Tiger snake, I think. Aiden's arms pulled at me, trying to put distance between us and the poor stunned snake. I shook my head and pulled away. Help Ben. Find the bite marks and tell the ambulance officers. Do your first aid and get him safely out of here. When he's on his way to hospital and some antivenin, I'll let the snake loose. Aiden gave a nod of understanding and attended to his patient. On his wrist here. Right into the vein. He pointed at the tiny puncture marks, wiping away a trickle of blood. Not a moment too soon, for the barman appeared. First aid kit, he announced holding out the box. Aiden's voice was calm and methodical. Get me a pressure bandage, I think he's been bitten by a tiger snake that was hiding in the woodpile. He held out a hand expectantly. The flustered barman fumbled through the first aid kit and held out a bandage, his hand shaking. I crossed the shed in two strides and took it from him, ripping open the packaging to hand the bandage to Aiden. He wrapped Ben's arm tightly from the visible bite marks on his wrist up past his elbow, before Aiden demanded and was given more bandages. The ambulance officers didn't take long, for their station wasn't far away, and it seemed like no time before we heard the sound of the ambulance siren. Mark left to guide them to the shed. Tiger snake bite. Swab the area and get some antivenin in him straight away, Aiden ordered. It's been half an hour since the bite, you need to act fast, as he's already showing some signs of paralysis. The ambulance officers nodded fervently as they shifted Ben to a stretcher and into the ambulance. Both turned to Aiden to ask if he wanted to accompany them. For a moment Aiden hesitated, but he slid an arm around my waist instead. No. I'm not on duty this weekend. And I've had a couple of whiskies. Raise the on-call doctor on the radio and have him meet you at the hospital. I think Lachlan's on today. The paramedics nodded again, before climbing back into the ambulance with their patient, and heading off. I ducked into the shed while the two men watched the ambulance. I moved to the other side of the block of wood, where I could see the snake's head. I looked into her open eyes. She was short but fatter than most tiger snakes I'd seen. I nodded carefully at her, humming my daughter's lullaby for luck, as I touched my foot to the log trapping her coils. With a flick of my foot, I rolled the wood toward me, releasing her. She slithered away with difficulty to the darkest corner of the shed. Take care, little one, I murmured to the small snake, who looked as if she was about to give birth. She'd had a precious burden indeed to defend from Ben the distiller. She disappeared into the darkness beneath the woodpile. I left the snake in her shed and joined the two men, who hadn't noticed my absence. He'll name his next whiskey after you, Dr. Aiden. You saved his life. Mark beamed at Aiden. Aiden shook his head gravely. No, I think Ben should name his next whiskey after. The snake, I interrupted with a forced smile. He should name the whiskey after the snake that bit him. Tiger snake it is. Mark laughed, sounding giddy. Aiden glanced at me and I smiled, moving to his side. His arm circled me again as he kissed me. Time to go home, Belle? I nodded, fighting to hold my smile in place. We both bade Mark goodbye and walked slowly to Aiden's mini. 38. 
It wasn't until we were back on the road to his house that Aidan asked, Why didn't you speak up for yourself, Belle? You knew exactly what to do there. If Ben names a whiskey after anyone, it should be you. You saved his life. I smiled gently. People want to hear it from a doctor, not a midwife. If he'd gone into labor, then they'd have listened to me. Besides, you had everything under control. Aiden persisted. But dot the snake. I never even saw it. If you hadn't, then it might have been too late when he got to hospital. You listened and that's what matters. You saved his life Aiden, not me. I smiled again, brighter this time. And I'm sure Mark the barman is happily spreading that story right now. Enjoy it, Aiden. This is what you're capable of doing. Thanks to you. Only with you, Aiden replied, taking his eyes off the road to stare at me. I wanted to meet his eyes, but one of us had to watch the road. Watch out. I shouted, in time for him to avoid the kamikaze kangaroo by swerving onto the wrong side of the road and back again. The words stuck in my throat. The reply I wanted to make but couldn't. Aiden. Aiden's eyes remained glued to the road for the remainder of the trip back, as did mine. No more kangaroos tried to kill themselves or us. Lucky lived for another day. We reached the house and Aiden reached over to caress my face, pulling me in close for a passionate kiss. And another. I didn't want to move, nor leave the car, relishing the closeness and comfort this man brought. A third kiss came to a close and Aiden pulled away. Let me get the fire going and we can continue this, uninterrupted, he begged. I'll help, I replied quickly as he led the way to his own woodshed. I didn't trust the snakes to leave him be for me without me there to remind them. Together, the work went faster as we filled a wheelbarrow load of wood for the house and headed back for another. I stacked the wood as Aidan constructed something complicated on the hearth with paper, sticks and small kindling. He touched a flaming match to the creation and set it alight, much like he did my heart. I watched him for a moment as his eyes danced with reflected flame. Fire on water. Aiden turned and smiled at me. Let's wash up and then the one thing I want to do most is get you out of those clothes. I returned his smile, still a little shaken. Same, I admitted, trying to match his light tone. 39. Spread those lovely legs for me, Belle, Aiden murmured between kisses as his lips moved down my breasts. His hands caressed my thighs as I willingly complied. Let me show you how grateful I am for what you did today. His words confused me as his lips distracted me, traveling lower until they tickled my inner thigh. More confused than ever, I tried to pull away. Bell, he began, his hands stroking where his lips had been only moments before. So close, almost teasing me, for I knew what he could do with those hands. I shifted again, so my legs were wider apart than before. I'd like to taste you. What? I sat up quickly, staring at him. My body shifted from aroused to afraid, as if I'd plunged into cold water. You want to what? My alarm grew. To taste you, my beautiful bell, Aiden murmured, touching his tongue to my skin. A slow lick until I stiffened at the sensation, from my nipples to my spine. I'd never felt anything so strange. Aiden laughed, looking up at my face. Look at you, Belle. I'd think you'd never. I shook my head, not sure how to tell him I had no idea what he meant. Fifteen fumbling minutes in the back seat of a car with a man whose name I never knew, hadn't prepared me for whatever Aiden wanted to do to me now. I felt fear. Oh Belle, I'm not going to bite you, he began again, still laughing. His laughter died as he realized he'd guessed my thoughts. Hey! He sat up too, on his knees between my legs, pulling me to his bare chest. I thought you'd like it. Don't freeze up on me again, Belle. Please? His voice held an urgent entreaty. I slowly relaxed into his embrace, telling myself I was being silly. 
I'm not the fucking ice queen, I mumbled, the words slipping out before I realized I'd spoken them aloud. Aiden's laughter rocked us both as he stroked my still knotted hair with one hand, gently undoing the knot to let my hair down once more. That's right you're not. You're warm and wonderful, my beautiful Belle. The stroking stopped, before resuming a moment later, slower and more intimate. Just like in that amazing shower we took together this morning. His fingers were deft, reminding me. He kissed me deeply, taking my gasp as he took me to the cusp of a climax. I love you, Belle. I shouted his name, my body shuddering, almost drowning out his heartfelt words. Yet I clung to him too, aware of every syllable and every sensation he inspired in me. I wished I had the breath to reply in kind. Aiden held tight to me, murmuring in my ear. Now if it's all right with you, I'd like to do with my tongue what I just did with my fingers. I think you'd enjoy it. But it's up to you, Belle. I just want to hear you scream my name like that again. I struggled for breath. Is dot are you as good with your mouth as with your hands? Better. Aiden kissed me as the growled word faded into the air. Slowly, he leaned me back until my head rested on his satin-skinned pillow again. Our lips parted and he smiled. Shall I? He dipped his head to touch his tongue to my nipple, delicately caressing the pink skin until it tingled. Yes, I whispered uncertainly, closing my eyes. A gentle kiss touched my mouth before Aiden chuckled. I won't hurt you, Belle. I just want to pleasure you any way you'd like. Anything you want me to do. Just name it. His hands caressed my breasts and belly as he moved. His next kiss was equally gentle, though considerably lower. Relax, Belle. I tried, but from the first swipe of his tongue I was lost to the electrifying sensation as Aiden set my every nerve alight with the fire of his love. Lust. Ah, maybe both. And mine. I surrendered to his skill. Oh Aiden, Aiden, oh. 40. Day darkened to night, and I made love with Aiden. We felt no hurry, nor desire to stop. He was a sweet lover, for all his fire. Like mixing his fiery whiskey with cool water, our time together was enhanced by our joining. His every caress felt burned into my skin, yet I burned for more. Oh, Aiden. I didn't sleep on the floor by the fire that night, nor barricaded in the bedroom nearest the bathroom. I shared Aiden's bed and slept beside him on satin when we chose to sleep. And when we didn't, I ached for more. That night, I woke in darkness, thirsty for water. I disentangled my body from Aiden's embrace and padded to the kitchen. Through the kitchen window I spied movement on the edge of the lawn, where trees and bush met grass. I held still and watched. Keeping low, a large striped cat, the size and shape of a greyhound, stalked the edge of the bush. Her ears pricked at the slightest sound and once her head turned so she looked right at me. She froze, as did the two tiny cubs at her paws. With such small young, I knew her den must be close by. As I met her gaze, I nodded slowly. Her secret was safe with me, as long as she did not betray any of my secrets. She and her cubs flitted between two trees and were gone. The Nanup tiger lived, and she was not alone. I quenched my thirst with tap water, before returning to Aiden's bed. As I slid in beside him, he stretched an arm across me to stroke my leg. I thought you'd disappeared and maybe I'd just dreamed you. His hand curved around my thigh, slowly moving upward. Would you like to inspire some sweet dreams to see us through till morning? I could take sleep or sex, but I knew that when morning came, I'd be driving home. The burning fire our passion kindled tonight would be cold soon enough. Fire could not burn forever. But it could burn for one more night. And oh how I burned for him now. I stretched and spread out as his fingers slid inside. My breath hissed out in response as a far hotter snake thrust into a welcome home. Sleep could wait. 41. I lay on my side facing Aiden, sated and sleepy. 
My fingers still stroked his chest hair, even as he started to snore. Rain drummed on the roof, washing away with it my willpower to leave. With every passing moment, more and more I wanted to lie beside him, till Monday morning dawned. Just one more loving encounter and I'd leave, I told myself, but I lied. I love this man too much. The sky started to lighten and still I stared at him. I leaned over him, holding my breath, and brushed my lips lightly across his. One last kiss. No more. I had exams tomorrow, and a long drive home today. Were he awake, he'd tell me to go, to become the qualified midwife I wanted to be. Did I still want that? Of course I told myself. All this effort for a qualification. That was why I was here. Aiden wouldn't ask me to throw that away. Two weeks is all. I could return once I finished my exams. And tell him the words I couldn't say. Sticky and smelling of sex, I should have showered. Instead, I savored Aiden's smell on my skin. I dressed and packed up my things. The brown bagged bottle of whiskey clinked as I lifted my bag, a reminder. I lifted it out, torn between giving it to Aiden as I'd intended, or keeping it for myself, to remember him. I will return to drink it with him, so I'll leave it here. I folded the bag and slid it like a note card beneath the bottle. Taking a pen from the desk, I carefully wrote two heartfelt words. Thank you. It seemed like so little when he'd given me so much, so below it I scrawled three more. I love you. With one last glance at the room where Aiden slept, I left his house, forcing every step I took to my car. The sooner I left, the sooner I could return. And I'd never have to leave again, as long as he lived. 42. The sun rose on my tears, but I kept my foot on the accelerator as my car drove north. Away from Aiden, though I ached for him still. When I reached Mother's house, I was tired from my long drive and voluntary sleep deprivation. I dropped my bag in my room and trudged wearily to the kitchen, where she sat at the dining table, reading a book in the afternoon sun. You'll need to go to the chemist to get a pregnancy test, Mother stated, not lifting her eyes from her book. Why, who needs one? I asked. You, Mother answered. She closed her book and laid it on the table. I thought you were going to wait until after you'd completed your studies to try for another child. She smiled as if she already knew what my answer would be. I wouldn't have been surprised. I received a particularly attractive offer that I found I didn't want to refuse. I hadn't yet dared to let myself hope that Aiden had given me a healthy child, though I would have traded everything for her. Maybe even him. I shook my head. Her hopes flew too high for me. I don't even know if I can have another child. If I can, that will change everything. I stood stunned, looking at a future in my mind that I hadn't foreseen. Mother's smile grew wider. What was it about him that made him so attractive? I couldn't help but smile in response. He had fiery red hair. Everywhere. I shrugged, not wanting to discuss Aiden in detail with Mother. It's only a few weeks until I finish my final exams. I'll take the test afterwards, I said, opening the fridge in search of a drink and a desperate change of topic. Do we have any whiskey? Whiskey? Mother asked, looking up. You can't drink that if you're carrying a child. She smiled again. Your father had red hair too. Oh. I closed the fridge and poured myself a glass of water instead. I'd left him only this morning, yet I missed Aiden's fire so much. What was the man's name? Mother's eyes looked far away, into some memory of the past. Idly, I wondered if she'd ever loved a man as I did. Aiden, I replied. How was your practical experience in Albany? I smiled. Highly educational. 43. 
The pregnancy test sat in its plastic cover, while I waited the ten minutes that felt like ten times that. Time ticked away possibilities in my head. Duty or freedom? Love or loneliness? Aching or Aiden? Warmth or chill? Back to the life I knew or the thrill of change? A child or forever empty arms? Have you decided what you'll do next? Mother asked, standing in the doorway. I shook my head. It all depends on the results of this. Mother gave an understanding smile. She would advise me that we both knew the decision was mine alone. You know what will happen if he discovers your secret, she began. Her tone held warning. You know what you may have to do. If I'm carrying his child, the decision is out of my hands, I replied firmly. And if you cannot conceive a child? A tear slid down my cheek, but I remained resolute. Then I will make my choice. And I might not choose to return home with you, mother. She gave a solemn nod and I knew she understood. The men I loved both died. It's a hard decision to make. I remembered the moment the aching started, when I left Aiden's bedroom. It hadn't ceased since. My lips longed for his, my fingers itched to stroke him and my breasts ached to be held in his hands once more. My tongue burned for the fire on his. Oh Aiden, what I'd give to be back in your arms tomorrow. Destiny be damned. The timer trilled and mother graciously left me alone. My time was up. I picked up the plastic test, pressing my lips together as I peered down to see what it said. Epilogue Is it time to go to the whales yet? Zerafina asked, almost bouncing in her eagerness. I roused myself from my memories. I didn't often think of Aiden, for five years had passed since I had last seen him, but I tried to keep the memory fresh. Almost sweetheart, I replied. Give me a moment. I closed my eyes and wished the young doctor a healthy and happy life, the least he deserved for kindling a fire that would never go out. When fire and water mix, they create something extraordinary and new, but they cannot survive together. I'm sorry. Sirens do not stay with humans, especially not when. Come on, mummy. I see one. Zerafina squealed as a thick curly lock of red hair blew into her mouth in the strong winds. She spat it out again before darting off in front of me, toward the approaching whales. Her fiery tail glinted in the morning sun as she flicked it furiously to increase her speed. I sighed and dove through the water after her, my golden tail rippling in a more leisurely fashion, with far more power than my daughter's. I resolved to venture on land in the near future to drink a glass of whiskey and toast the health of her father, whose fire could never survive beneath the ocean's surface as my people did. After all, Aidan couldn't swim.